Hello, gamers. You're listening to the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. This is episode number 134. And welcome back to another edition of the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. I'm Brent Felsing, and joining me tonight, the full crew, everyone's back, Bender Holt, Ben Boyce, and Frankie Ayler. Gentlemen, another week of gaming is behind us. A bunch more games are coming up ahead of us. But Frankie, first of all, welcome back. You were out on the West Coast, the least coast, even though the East Coast is the Beast Coast. But you're back from your trip to Seattle. Did you have a good time, buddy? Sure did. It's a lot of fun. A lot of cool stuff stumbled across the pop cap offices i didn't know they were out there Ooh, it was cool because our right. hotel was a couple blocks from them so that was pretty cool but yeah a lot of fun i'm sure you're you're more than happy to be back in ohio though right <sighs> it was depressing <laughs> it was depressing coming back it didn't rain a single time while we were out there of course come back to cleveland rainy hot not for me I really thought it just rained all day in Seattle. I'm really surprised you didn't get any rain. Nope. It was beautiful out there. Fat guy weather, you know, like Mm. high 50s, low 60s. A lot of walking, Mm -hmm. but it was fine because everything was kind of right there. So, Oh, yeah. Dude, I'll walk for miles at 59. Dude, I'll walk forever. I don't even care. Yeah, that's what I said. It was like I took shorts and a T-shirt. Everyone out there is all bundled up because I guess that's cold for them. And I was just like, (laughs) (laughs) wusses. Right. That's like that's our June weather. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome. Awesome. Well, welcome back, buddy. We missed you last week. We may, glad you had a good trip. Uh, sorry to hear you're back in Ohio, but um, yeah, hey, it's all good. We're here to talk video games. You can forget about that right now. Yes. Bender, what's going on with you, buddy? Not too much, man. Just uh, been playing a lot of games lately. A lot of yeah? trying out a lot of different things. <laughs> Ooh. Well, well, we'll touch on that in just a few minutes when we, when we get into what we're playing. And that brings me to Mr. Boyce. Uh, Mr. Boyce, um, I, I, I sense you have like a long face. You're kind of bummed at the moment. What's what's going on, buddy? You okay? Uh, yeah, I'll survive. I mean, just uh, finished watching that disaster of a Michigan Michigan State game. Um, John O'Corn just a train wreck from from the get go. <laughs> so it was uh, it was not a pretty sight. It was. A game that both teams were honestly trying to lose. It was an ugly game, <laughs> though the weather was just terrible. It was just a, it was just a, it was just a bad game, man. And mm. Michigan came out on the losing end. Um, not shocking with the way that they played. So it's also, uh, it, it's also been an extremely long week, very very busy week for myself. I'm, uh, I'm tired at this point. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like I've been through the ringer this week. So. Uh, Happy to just kick back and unwind for a few minutes here. Right. Yeah. Um, you say it was an ugly game. I thought it was pretty cute. Um, <laughs> the first half, uh, I wouldn't say both teams were trying to lose. I would say one team was really trying to win and the other team was trying to figure <laughs> out how to stop them. But uh, other than that, yeah, it's, it, was, it was a great game. It was fun to watch. It's always intense, that rivalry. But, um, yeah, this week's been pretty busy, man. I've got everything packed up. I've got boxes as far as the – boxes, boxes everywhere as far as the eye can see. But uh, let's jump into a little bit of what we've been playing. Um, myself, I played a lot of Battle Chasers this week and uh, really, really enjoying that game. Um, I did run into a crash. Uh, that Airship Syndicate has since said they're working very, very hard to figure out what's the cause. There are some workarounds on their website, but they're not ideal. But the one thing that they mentioned that Frankie mentioned before them was save your, save your data. Save your backup. Back up all your saves as best you can. Put, maybe put them on a USB uh, card because simply because if you do the automatic update, it could automatically upload the the latest save because that's what they mentioned on their website. It's not accurate. You can't upload the corrupted save because I tried to do that just to restart uh-huh. and see if I could send it to them. You can't upload uh-huh. save data to the cloud. It won't let you. If it's corrupted. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's good then. I yeah. guess. Well, there you go. Save your uh, data as often as possible. Put it up in the cloud or put it on a thumb drive. Whatever you want to do. Just so you don't have to worry about a, a possible corrupted data, but Airship Syndicate is working on it. Hopefully, we'll get some kind of an update later this week. But um, I've enjoyed my time. What I have played with it—it's a beautiful looking game. It's a—it's a very good R- uh, RPG. Love the love the combat. The story is actually pretty intriguing, very interesting. The characters are likable, uh, so I'm really digging that. And then last night, 
I streamed Judge with a Y from 10 Tons Limited, and that's actually not a bad little game. It's very, very much in line with their previous titles, like a Neon Chrome. It's based on, like, Neon Chrome. There's some, I guess there's some connections there. But the gameplay is very, very similar, and uh, it's it, it's a fun little game. For fourteen ninety nine. you can't go wrong. But, I mean, if you've played one of their previous games, you know exactly what you're getting here. And, uh, yeah, it was a good time. But that's that's all I've really been playing. But, Bender, you alluded that you've been playing a lot of games. What have you been playing? Um... I've been, I've been playing a lot of um, Metroid Samus Returns lately, mm-hmm. taking it to work, and pl- I've gotten it about eight hours into that game. It's pretty good. It's pretty good so mm-hmm. far. I mm-hmm. you know, love Metroid games. It's always fun to explore and find the different upgrades and everything. There's some pretty cool moments. Um, a couple of things that are kind of repetitive about it because you're hunting down these Metroids and the, the fight is kind of the same for a couple of them that you do over and over again. But... Um, Still got a ways to go, but I'm enjoying that one so far. Um, got my SNES Classic Edition. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm sure you guys probably got one too. But uh, been playing a lot of different games on that thing. First thing I played was Super Mario World. Never get tired of that game. That's one of my favorite <laughs> games of all time. Um, played a little bit of the Final Fantasy game that's on there. It's very interesting so far. Played some Earthbound. Played a little bit of everything. So loving that thing. Um, I played a little bit of Cuphead. Mm. I, I, I know you talked about it last week, but um, it, Cuphead is really cool. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like I I really like the gameplay of it. Um, the obviously the art style is beautiful. The music is great, but the gameplay is just really good. It's really well designed. It's super difficult, but it's like difficult in a way that you can keep trying and keep trying and and eventually get through the each level. All the boss battles are really cool that I've done so far. I've only done like two boss battles in one of the platforming levels, so I've got a ways mm-hmm. to go on that. But um, that's been pretty good. And uh, I also downloaded Stardew Valley on my Switch. Mm. Played that for about an hour or two today. Um, hasn't hooked me yet, but I, I feel like it's a game, from everything I've heard, I feel like it's a game that will hook me. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, just it's it's kind of has a slow start so i'll I'll talk more about that at at another time but uh it's got a cool art style i like the the old old school art style the music is good and everything Mm -hmm. so so far that's pretty cool um i think that's about it but yeah i've been just messing around with a lot of different things not spending too much time on any one thing so far but yeah lots of stuff it's always nice to be able to take yourself away from Destiny 2 and just try out some other stuff mm-hmm. uh, while, while you get a chance. So, no, I dig it. Uh, Frankie, I want to t- t- come to you for just a second to talk a little bit about Pat Battle Chasers. Your review in progress is up on the site. Uh, if, if you want to check it out, go over to the website, www.shortpause.com. You can check out Frankie's uh, thoughts of the game after 36 hours, just before the corrupt data destroyed his save. But, uh, Frankie, the one thing I want to talk to you about uh, your review in progress, and I think it's it's something that I, I understand a little bit more of now that i played the game, is the testament of the fact that even though you lost 36 hours of progress, which in 99% of the time I would have just said, I'm done with this game. I'm not going back to on that time. I can't, I can't start over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, here you are. You've already jumped back into the game, and you're playing again. I kind of want to talk about what you like about that game so much that makes that, that that makes it easier for you to say forget the first 36 hours are gone i'm getting back into it it's really just the combat and i don't know why because i i typically am not a major you know turn based combat fan it's not it's mm-hmm. just not something i really ever enjoy but going through there and and like figuring out a strategy for every battle you know it, the way that that game works is like there's a bestiary so every time you kill an enemy you when you first encounter them you don't know anything about them but as you fight them more and more you know, you see their hit points, you can see what kind of attacks they're charging. So you can once you've kind of seen all the stuff they could do, you can kind of formulate a better plan of attack. So if they're doing a charge attack that you know is going to do a ton of damage to you, you can start mm-hmm. building up your defenses and do whatever you gotta do to, to lessen the blow. But it's it's seriously just playing the game and even the dungeons. Like I went back, I I redid the um iron outpost. This is the fourth time I've done that dungeon now. Completely different layout. So I, I, I love it. The fact that they're procedurally generated, you get in there, you have different, you have the same objectives, but you have, they're kind of like mixed up in how you approach them. Like there's different puzzles for different rooms. So mm-hmm. while you have like the same core objective, the thing that you have to do to achieve it is different. And mm-hmm. I, I, I absolutely love that. Cause I think those dungeons are a blast. Um, mm-hmm. 
the one thing I do want to touch on that I didn't really talk too much about in what I had written up for it is um, the tail end when I when I crashed the game and and it it corrupted everything. Um, I actually found a bug. They fixed it, mind you. So it kind of sucks that they fix this bug, but. Um, I was frantically running around trying to find a way to level up because once you hit the fourth dungeon, it, the difficulty spike in that game is insane. Um, it, it, like I, I literally went to the next dungeon and the difficulty like on the, the, the lowest setting still said impossible. So I, I had to find some way to go grind, level up. Um, you can only have three characters with you at a time. So as you like uh, the three other characters that eventually join your party, they all are at a set level when you meet them. So I just started mm-hmm. kind of going with them because they're at least a level ahead of the two, at least two characters I had with me. Mm-hmm. So doing all that kind of left a couple characters behind, which sucked because um, one of them, goalie is actually a really good tank class. So she can take mm-hmm. a lot of damage. She could draw enemy attacks to her. Um, but anyways, um, once, once I had, what I'd done is I had started messing around with the combat arena because if you die in combat in the wild, you go back to the inn, you don't gain XP from that fight, you lose a ton of gold. Um, but if you do the combat arena, if you fail, you're defeated, but you don't lose anything, you still gain XP from all the waves you're able to complete. So mm-hmm. I just started doing that because I was just trying to look for a way to level up so I could proceed with the game. So um, I got to a point where I was doing them that I had one of my characters couldn't attack or do anything. So I quit the game and if you quit during the arena, it puts you back at the entrance to the arena. But I figured, eh, whatever, I'm, I'm just not going to do this right now. So I left and started fighting some lesser enemies and it was still netting me XP from <laughs> the arena. So, oh, really? yeah. So instead of getting, you know, like 25 experience points, I'm getting 500 experience points for all these encounters. Got to level 30 within two hours, so I level 30 is the max level you can have your characters at, so at that point, that's when I went on to the next dungeon, did that, and then um, leaving there, I ran into one of these, there's these airships uh, at the beginning of the game. Um, if you watch the first 20 minutes on the site, uh, the, the way the story starts, there's some enemies that kind of blow you out of the sky. They randomly appear throughout the game. It's very, it's it's really random. That was, that 36 hours in was the first time I encountered them, yet... Um, I just restarted my playthrough, and I actually ran into him coming out of the Iron Outpost. So mm. I, I'm not really sure what, you know, what triggers them showing up on the map, but it's just like an airship that's flying across the map as you're running around, and they'll hunt you down and you jump up and fight them. So um, mm-hmm. it's a very challenging fight. They're all kind of on par with you, so the you know they have a lot of regenerative abilities, and they're uh, very it's very easy to lose that fight. So. Um, but yeah, so once I, I did that, I, th- I think that p- played a role in my corrupted save file just because that, that bug shouldn't have been there. And it's one of the ones that they had, you know, addressed that was going to be fixed in the patch, which I at that point still hadn't been able to download. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, the patch on the PS4 went live on Saturday, like right as I was getting ready to fly out of town. So I downloaded it and I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll leave this. And, you know, when I get back, I'll start messing with it again. But um. The, the reason also that I really um, wanted to give that game a chance is it's not only the fact that I really do love the game, it's the fact that I've been talking with them in this process, you know, trying to figure out if there's a way to fix my save or anything. The amount of things that they were, like, consider- like offering me as a solution, it was incredible. Like, I've never had talked to a developer before where they've, you know, acknowledged that I'm, like, asking them a question about a problem I've run into, but offering so many different solutions Mm-hmm. So, like, seriously, my hat's off to them. Like, that was really awesome for them to just offer so many different things, like from sending me a Steam version that would have a checkpoint where I was that I could continue. Um, oh, wow. If there was a way to get my PlayStation save to them, they were going to see if they could fix the corrupted save, you know, hack the save and send it back. Like, they had a couple ideas. Um, and they even offered to send me an Xbox copy because apparently that version is totally fine. Um, I've actually already purchased an Xbox copy, so I was like, no, that's, that's cool, so... Uh, but no, seriously, like Airship Syndicate's super awesome developers that I've I've just been really humbled at the fact that they've been kind of back and forth, you know, kind of giving me solutions to or, you know, tips for some of this stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I really love that game. I do that art style, the music, the combat, the dungeons, uh, the world. It's just, it's such a good game. I love it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, dude. From what I've played so far, I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm about, I think I'm now seven hours into the game. Um, I just hit. Um, I did, I've done two dungeons. I did the uh, Path of Fangs, the Iron Outpost, and I just hit the third dungeon down on the bottom right side of the map. I can't yeah, remember where I'm. Junk, junk Town. Is it Junk Town? Yeah, yeah I junk love that Town. one. That's one of my favorite ones. 
that's the one I just got to. And that's where I had to save it. So I'm um, looking forward to jumping back into that. But thank you, sir. We really appreciate your input. We'll be looking forward to your final review somewhere down the line Someday. as you make your way through the game again. But if you want to check out his review in progress or if you want to see the first 20 minutes, visit the website, www.shortpause.com. You'll see both those right on there, and you can watch or read Frankie's a review in progress, whatever you want to do. Really good stuff. So good stuff from Frankie. Thank you, sir. Mr. Boyce, over to you. I know on Tuesday night you streamed – Mystic Bell. I want to get your thoughts on that just uh, momentarily here. Yeah, we fired up Mystic Bell on the Indie Spotlight. Honestly, I was I was really tired playing that game, <laughs> so I was I was falling asleep while I was streaming the game. So if you watch that video, I haven't gone back and watched it, but there may be there may be portions where I'm talking and my speech just tails off. I, I have no idea. That's what it felt like I was doing as I was playing that. So I was just trying to get through the stream. Uh through no no fault of the, of the game itself. I mean, it's a fine game. It's a it's a old school eight bit platformer. It's got this really interesting um, mixture of of like point and click adventure game elements and the fact that you're getting random items as you go through the the dungeon or, or whatever you're going through or the castle that you're going through, and you have to figure out how to combine those items to solve puzzles and and open up different areas of the castle for you to go through. You know, in in true Metroidvania style. So it's it's interesting in, in that respect. Um, it does seem like that could get grading as you move on deeper into the process, as you're collecting these things and you're going through this Metroidvania castle and you're trying to figure out what goes where. But you know, just the the hour I played with it, I thought it was fun. Thought it was a fine game. Um, something something I think that uh, that you could have fun with. Just uh, just be prepared to, you know have some of those adventure game frustrations where you're trying to figure out what item goes where. So just mm-hmm. just be ready for that. It's going to be a lot of you beating your head against the wall, running back and forth, trying to figure out which item goes where. But, uh, but yeah, I uh, like, like I said, it wasn't able to really give it a, a full-on fair shake when I was playing it, but uh, the brief period I played with it seemed like it was a cool game. Other than that, man, that's, that's pretty much all I've played this week. I got a couple hours in with Destiny. That was all I could squeeze in. That was basically it. And it doesn't sound like this week's going to get any easier for you in terms of being able to play games. You're going out of town for a while. I got a lot of moving to do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I- I'm with you, buddy. It's going to be tough to get any gaming in this week. But hopefully, after this week, things will get kind of back to normal in the- at the short pause offices. Indeed. Anybody, uh, anybody else try out the Battlefront 2 beta? I played one round and got owned, but mm-hmm. I did like it. I thought it looked really, really good. It's, yeah, it it's a beautiful looking game. Uh, surprising for a beta. That it has both 4K and HDR support ready to go. So I thought that was really cool. The game looks gorgeous. Obviously, Dice knows how to kick out a beautiful game. No exception, Battlefront 2, but I only played a little bit. Did you play any of it, Frankie? I did. I, I got a couple matches in. Um, I was playing uh, the smaller one. I forget what the mode's called, but it's kind of like a capture the flag type of mode. Mm-hmm. So I was watching mm-hmm. about that because I didn't really feel like doing the big 40 player thing. It's, right. it's fun, but I like doing that with friends. It's just easier mm-hmm. to coordinate that one. But. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. It's uh, I don't know if I'm going to pick it up on day one or not just because I have a ton of stuff building in the backlog right now, but mm-hmm. it feels like more Battlefront, so that's good. Mm-hmm. I liked it, though. I, I even actually, I, surprisingly, because I didn't do this in the first game, but I, I was doing the first-person mode, and I actually was doing pretty well, so mm. that, that's awesome because the first first uh, Battlefront, I, or the you know first Battlefront, I uh, turned off first-person mode because it just it drove me crazy, and I sucked with it, but... Right. It's a lot better. Actually doing pretty good with it now? Yeah. So. Oh, all right. That's cool. Frankie's evolving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I dig it. Benner, did you get to play that at all, the beta? No, I didn't even realize till today that it was that it was open. Uh, I got to uh, check my email. I don't check my email often enough. So, um, do you know, guys know how long it's running? Uh, um, I think tomorrow, tomorrow, Monday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, You'll have, it'll be up, it'll be up, it'll be all day tomorrow, Sunday, so you can play it tomorrow. Okay, I might try to hop in and check it out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if if only there were a podcast where you could find that kind of information. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that'd be swell. That's, that's the only reason I knew about it. When we were, I turned the show on, I turned last week's show on when we were um, probably about half hour out of Cleveland. So I listened to the new release. I was like, oh, I know that beta is this week. Holy crap. <laughs> well, I am not a fan of this show. No. <laughs> 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 I don't care for those guys. They're smug and inaccurate with their reporting. Yeah, appreciate the support, Bender. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all right, Mr. Boyce, let's get into this week's uh, new releases, buddy. 
Let's get into it. And at the top of this list, we have a very big title, and that's Middle Earth Shadow of War. So, yeah. game I've been looking forward to for a long time. Frankie's been looking forward to for a long time. The gaming world at large been looking forward to for a very long time. So, Middle Earth Shadow of War, of course, the sequel to Shadow of Mordor, which was was honestly a game I I absolutely loved. Absolutely loved that game. I uh, you know I I love the Batman style of combat. I, to me, that's that's one of the better combat styles in third person gaming as as we stand today it's uh it's just it's really got that you know easy to pick up and play but difficult to master feel about it so it's easy mm-hmm. to get in there and hit buttons and and you know beat up guys and, and get combos but you know can you get in there and string all your moves together or you know really really use all of your abilities in in sync and and figure out how to take down tougher enemies and that kind of stuff so i, I love that style of combat so uh, uh, I love Lord of the Rings too. So it was uh, it was a great match with Shadow of Mordor. It was a game that wasn't it was an over an open world that wasn't overwhelming. So it was one that I could hop into and not feel like man, you know, mm-hmm. am I ever gonna get to this corner of the map or ever figure out what's going on here? So right. I I loved everything about Shadow of Mordor. It's, it's one of my favorite games on PS4. So I've been looking forward to Shadow of War for a long time. It's coming out this week. Uh, finally. But I probably won't pick it up because I'm not gonna have time to play it. So it's uh, be honest, be honest, Ben. You're not picking up because of the microtransactions. You're not picking up because of that reason. Uh, Everyone's up in arms. I'm not uh, buying it because of that game. Are you buying it, Frankie? Totally. I already did. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us why, Frankie. Tell us why you're buying it because the microtransactions aren't a big deal, are they, buddy? No, nope, sure ain't. <laughs> yeah, what so, a shame. So you you bring that up, Brent. So let's just, let's just tackle the elephant in the room right now with uh, with Shadow of War. So the the great microtransaction debate. We heard about this prior to the game, you know, to the game releasing this week. This has been in the news cycle for the last month or two. But that there's going to be microtransactions in Shadow of War, and you can purchase these loot boxes, and, and I guess they give you access to different orcs for your army and and whatnot. But mm-hmm. um. You know, we and we talked about this on a past show, but with Shadow of War being primarily a single player game, it didn't really bother any of us. You know, if you want to go out there and you want to buy a loot crate and enhance your game experience, whatever, you know, that's 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 your prerogative. But in a single mm-hmm. player game, your choice to buy a loot crate doesn't affect my game. So at the end mm-hmm. of the day, who cares? You know, there then there was the issue with well, there's this online mode that's attached to the game, which not really 100% sure exactly how that works, but that's got something to do with building up your army, and it's kind of this asynchronous mode, not necessarily like a, a 1v1 battle mode, so then people were, were kind of uh, questioning how that was going to operate. Um, so I, I understand all that, but as we sit here with, with Shadow of War, now as you read the reviews that are coming out for this game, there is one contingent of people which says, hey, in order for you to get to the true end game and, and get to the, the point that you're trying to get to in Shadow of War, you have to spend money on microtransactions and unlock some of these legendary orcs or whatever. And there's another contingent of people which say, that's BS. You don't have to do any of that. You can simply play through the game. You don't have to buy any of this stuff. It's all there in the game for you. You just got to find it. So at the end of the day, we're left sitting here as consumers like, okay, well, who do we believe? Do we believe this Mm -hmm. guy over here that says you have to buy it or this guy over here that says you don't have to buy it? Now, um, uh, Frankie, I think at the end of the day, it it seems like, you know, that you don't have to buy the loot boxes if you don't want to. Like you can get in there and you can play this game. You don't have to purchase them. So uh, that's the side of the debate that I'm leaning towards right now. I've seen enough evidence to to justify that that side of the equation. So I'm you know I'm not up in arms about the microtransaction things. I'm not mm-hmm. you know really deep into this stuff. So I haven't really researched how this is gonna affect the asynchronous online part of the game don't know how big that is or what exactly that entails but uh i don't know man where where do you where do you stand on all of this are you still excited for shadow of war um what are your thoughts uh, i really haven't changed my mind since saying before they don't matter um probably not gonna buy any um like with any game you're gonna get what you put into it so you know we've seen evidence that you can go out there you can encounter a lot of these legendary orcs in the wild If you put the time into the game, if you want to spend the money and don't feel like putting 40, 50 hours into the game, that's an option. That's all it is. It's an option. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm really confused about, too, is this 
this notion that people are saying that you have to purchase loot boxes, they're random loot boxes. Like, spending money on anything doesn't guarantee you any single orc or anything. So, why, like, I, I just I don't understand how they're saying, like, oh, yeah, you have to do this to, to get this guy. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to get that guy. I might get a bunch of other junk. Like, so, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not, like, you know, informed of how the loot boxes in this game actually work because I don't care. So, I haven't really been following mm-hmm. it. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I... I not bothered by it at all. I, I don't care. I know I'm going to play that game for 50, 60 hours anyways. So mm-hmm. if I end up I deciding to dump money into it, I will. But I don't I don't see that happening. Yeah, I can see it doing like what some games do with loot boxes. They'll have like a, a first tier loot box for X amount. And then, you know, a second tier one for a little bit more that, you, you know, you'll get guaranteed this, 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 and possibly some of these things. And then a third tier one, like you're guaranteed a legendary orc or something like that, which probably makes it a little bit or more makes it look like that's what you're trying to do but if you have to grind at the end of a game a little bit a single player game a world you want to want to explore if there's missions and whatnot to unlock that'll help you get these legendary orcs that's just that's just that's just the first that's a single player game right there that's that's what you do the other thing too that that boys even alluded to is these are end game things Mm -hmm. this is stuff you're doing after you complete the campaign so if there's Mm -hmm. another ending on top of that that you are going to continue playing the game chase Mm -hmm. you're already there i mean just keep, keep grinding. You've already spent enough time beating the game. You might as well just keep grinding. And yeah. And the other that's thing what it's is all like, about. That game is just fun to mess around with. Like, the Nemesis system is really cool. I can't I can't even tell you how many hours that I spent in the first game just going in there, manipulating that thing, trying to get all these different characters in these different places so I could bring them all together, and then you could just, you know, kill everyone at once in one spot. It's pretty <laughs> cool. So yeah. mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. The... Uh... A question for you, Brent, about all this. So, regardless of your thoughts on microtransactions or even the uh, the issue with the charity DLC that was going mm-hmm. on earlier, uh, you know, a month or two ago with how that was going to play out, there's been this kind of weird negativity around this game with with some of these things that have gone on with it. So, uh, I want to ask you, man, is this is this going to affect this game at all? So, regardless of of what the end result is or what the final narrative for this game is going to be like is this sort of this stigma this air of negativity that's surrounding some of the kind of extraneous details of this game is this going to affect shadow of war in any kind of significant way like i think back to something like evolve so we Mm -hmm. remember when that game came out and there was this whole hoo-ha about the microtransactions in that game which were Mm -hmm. were far uh, Less even even than Shadow of Warrior. That that was simply just cosmetic items for your character mm-hmm. that that really had no bearing on anything in the game. So that was a, a strange one for people to get up in arms about. And even then, like that had an effect on that game. You know whether whether or not they they would admit it or not. Like it created this negative stigma around Evolve, and I think it transferred over to the main game when it actually came out. Is there a possibility that that happens here with Shadow of War? What do you think? I think there's a possibility this negative like stigma will, will carry on for a little bit, but I don't think this is going to. We're going to see something like we saw with Evolve. Evolve was a new IP, and that that affected it. But this Shadow of War has Shadow of Mordor behind it, so anybody who's played Shadow of Mordor knows what to expect and what what they're excited for Shadow of War. And I think it's just going to be the, the the casual gamer and the uninformed that are gonna that are gonna that that it might affect their decision to pick up the game because seriously this thing blew up this news blew up and like you said there's this this negative stigma around tra- microtransactions right now uh you know that's been kind of fired up by you know Shadow of War as well as Forza 7 and all this stuff going on right now i mean i could see it possibly affecting some people who might have been on the fence or people who are like i said are uninformed about how these microtransactions work and what how they really do affect the game if at all mm-hmm. but i just think that there is going i don't think it's go, i don't think you're going to see the type of effect that we saw with evolve because like i said evolve was a new ip mm-hmm. and nobody knew what to expect nobody said oh man the first evolve was great i'm going to pick this next one up evolve was evolve and there was just this horrible this horrible news went out about this the microtransactions and the stuff that you could buy and everyone just like nope not buying that game mm-hmm. and that was it it didn't have anything to kind of fall back on to reassure fans mm-hmm. that you know hey look no it's okay it's okay whereas this one still has shadow mortar behind it yeah i mean um and and outside of the microtransactions there was the the element that the game didn't have a, a single player aspect to it as well so that was right. that was working mm-hmm. against it in addition to the microtransaction so it's kind of a perfect storm with that game um 
Now, what do you think, Frankie? Is this going to affect Shadow of War at all? It, like Brent said, I think it's very possible. Um, word of mouth, especially about something negative like that, tends to spread oh, pretty yeah. fast. Even, I, uh, <laughs> funny side story, I was at Chipotle. I had a des- my Destiny shirt on, and the guy in front of me just you know turned around and was like, oh, yeah, hey, how are you liking the game? Shader stuff, huh? That stuff sucks. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, I don't know. I mean, I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't know, but... I, stuff like that does it, it tends to kind of go a little more mainstream so people are going to know about that stuff versus you know the fact that you know these games this shadow of war in particular has a ton of stuff for you to do mm-hmm. so I, I it's it's a concern for sure but i think over time once people start playing it people are enjoying it that'll kind of mm-hmm. s- fall to the wayside yeah it's it's very strange um all, all said and, and done, though, Middle Earth Shadow of War has reviewed very well. It's got a very high Metacritic score. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, people seem to be loving the game. And, you know, uh, make no mistake, I, I would love to sit down and play this game because, like I said, I absolutely love Shadow of, of Mordor. I just, uh, I'm not going to be able to find the time in the next few weeks to sit down with Shadow of War. So I will pick this game up. It's just, uh, it's just I won't be able to get to it. <laughs> I've kind of, I've kind of, I've kind of made my peace with the fall here. Where I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna play Destiny when I can, and there's a couple other games I'm gonna pick up, and that's gonna be that. Um, but uh, yeah, so Shadow of War dropping in a in a very busy fall here. That'll be available Tuesday. Another big title this week is The Evil Within Two. This is a Friday the Thirteenth release. Um, so Brent, I'm, I'm gonna go to you on this one. I never played the first Evil Within. I know you you played a lot of it. it got pretty close to the end. Um, I know you're looking forward to Evil Within Two. Talk to me about this game, man. Is this a direct sequel to the first one? Um, is, or what What can you tell me about this game? I actually vo- know very little about this game uh, in terms of like the story and wh- how it relates to the first one. All I do know is I'm picking this baby up, and I'll be streaming this uh, Friday night for a little bit after work. I'm going to try to get a little stream up on the site. Cool. Uh, Bender, are you going to be there at midnight picking this one up? <laughs> <laughs> it looks, yeah. like, looks like one right up, right up your alley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Frankie, you uh, you looking forward to Evil Within Two? Kinda, yeah. Um, I'm with Brent. I think I left off at chapter twelve, eleven mm-hmm. or twelve. I'm pretty close to the end as well. Um, I there's a lot of things about the first game that bothered me, just the way it played. The camera angles were kind of weird. Some of the controls were a little weird. So I'm hoping a lot of that's mm-hmm. been addressed. Um, I know it, it dropped the letterbox format that they had too. So hopefully, even if you know the the camera's still a little too close to him. It's not as bad because the screen you have the whole screen now. Um, but yeah, I like. I don't really know much about the story of this game. I don't remember him mentioning a daughter in the first game. So I know this one's kind of centered around him rescuing his daughter. So I just, it's the I same know. same character. It's the same character. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, there, there there wasn't a whole lot to take from the first trailer that we saw from this game. It was it, there was there was some stuff there, but it didn't give us a whole lot of, of like what to expect from the story. Yeah, it, it seems like it's got some religious undertones to it and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. seems very different from the first game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I really liked that trailer. I thought I thought the game looked like it uh, could could be scary as hell. It looks like it could be a, a really cool experience. But um, I still, like I said, I haven't played through the first Evil Within. Don't have any experience with the franchise, so I'll be sitting on the sidelines on this one until I can find some time to get through the first one and maybe get into this one at some point. But that'll be out on Friday uh, alongside this game, Friday the 13th. Uh, that's the game. <laughs> Friday the 13th, the game. The retail version of this game will be out on Friday the 13th. So uh, a very clever bit of marketing by those those guys over there at uh, Gun Media. So um, uh, Friday the 13th, the game, we've we've documented th- this the troubles of this game. <laughs> Frankie, are you at least going to get your physical copy of this game? Is it is it at least coming to you? It seems like it. I got an email. Okay. I think it was yesterday morning for us to update our backer kits with our addresses. So I guess as soon mm-hmm. as they get them in, they're gonna start shipping them out. Mm-hmm. The thing I'm sad about is I realized the tier that I backed. I'm supposed to get a, so- a digital soundtrack. Mm. That's not happening until the single player stuff is done. Apparently, so I was kind of mm. bummed to see that. Which we'll, if we we'll see that till winter time. If we yeah. look on the roadmap, you got to go after the pumpkin and before the <laughs> before the snowflake. That's where the. That's where the single player <laughs> stuff stuff comes in. So, Merry Christmas, me. <laughs> does the retail release of this game does it does it signal anything else being added to the game, or is there anything that's coming along with this? Skins, maps, skins, anything, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You get a, like I that. know there's a Jason skin, and I think one of the 
skin packs or the console the counselors, but that's about it. Cool. So yeah, if you've been holding out for the physical version of this game, your wish will be granted this Friday. Uh, also this week, Raid World War II. Um, this is the, I don't know, I, I guess it's like payday in a, in a World War II setting is the best way to describe this game. Now, uh, Brent, to, to say this game looks rough would be an understatement. Oh, this, is a, this is a terrible looking game. Yeah, we fired up, uh, we were talking about this the other day, and I was yeah. like, I don't know if I've seen a, tra- a new trailer come out yet, and they did release one, uh, I think it was a month ago, and uh, it starts off live action with John Cleese. And, yeah, uh, goes and what the, the, what the hell John Cleese is doing in this ad is, yeah. is anybody? <laughs> Guess. Yeah, you, you just can't pick people at random. I can do anything I like. I mean, I'm eccentric. Like it's just, yeah, it, it was weird. And then when the gameplay showed up, I mean, this looks, it looks bad in terms of like the the visual presentation. Now I don't know what kind of like upgrade system there is. There might be some depth to it, but in terms of presentation, it's not a good looking game. It does not look good at all. It looks very cheap. Um, but that's just from. But I mean. And I want to say it's just a trailer, but damn it, you're trying to sell your game with this trailer. It's a launch trailer. It's a gameplay trailer, and it just mm-hmm. did not look good. Yeah. Now, like I said, I don't know what's under the hood. I don't know how much depth there is to the story or to the, the cooperative experience how, how, or even how the missions are laid out. But from a visual perspective from that trailer, that did not look good. Yeah. I mean, to even even say it looked like an early PS3 title, that might even be generous. It's a- mm-hmm. It uh, was was not a good looking title. It's difficult to tell from the trailer what the frame rate is going to be like, but that didn't look like that was going to be up to up to snuff with what we expect out of these kind of games. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I think this is a forty dollar game as well. It's coming to retail and digital. So if anybody gets their hands on on Raid World War Two, let us know how that is. Um, but yeah, not uh, expectations not high for that one. I think that's actually a sixty dollar game. Is it sixty? Wow! Yeah, so. Wow! Let me double checking now, but I could have sworn it was fifty three ninety nine on PSN. It is. It is fifty three ninety nine. Wow! I do remember seeing that. It is fifty three ninety nine because I was like, "Oh, that's cool! It's on sale." And then I was like, and "Then I remember the trailer, and I was like, oh. Now I'm I'm looking at Amazon right now, and it's thirty nine ninety nine on there. So whether that's a price mistake or <laughs> not, mm, nope, nope, you're right. GameStop is too. I swear I saw PSN. GameStop has it for thirty nine ninety nine as well. Okay, yeah. cool. So yeah, uh, Raid World War Two. Buyer beware on that one. Make sure you you know what you're getting before you hop in there. Uh, moving on with this list, Raiden Five Director's Cut will be available both digital and at retail. Long running shoot 'em up series, which has uh, usually been pretty good. Echo, which I think is a is a very cool looking sci fi like Hitman kind of game, where you mm-hmm. are tasked with. Um, <laughs> Basically, you're trying to maneuver your way through this uh, this like palace that that you're in, uh, where there's murderous duplicates of yourself that are that are out to get you, and they kind of mimic your movements. Very very interesting signing game. It's difficult to describe here. You kind of got to watch the trailer to get an idea how it works. But I think that game looks super rad. Now, uh, uh, Brent, you mentioned earlier that I'm going to be out of town this week, so I'll be gone Tuesday through Friday. I'll be gone on business. So I won't be able to do the indie spotlight this week. But you, sir, will. You're going to step in yeah. Tuesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern, on our YouTube channel. You're going to do the Indie Spotlight, and you are going to feature Echo uh, mm-hmm. on the, mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. spotlight there. Um, so I, I assume you think it looks pretty cool as well. Yeah, Frankie brought this to my attention a couple weeks back, and uh, it's by uh, some of the developers are from IO Interactive, correct, Frankie? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so obviously they have experience with this type of game, like a third person. There's stealth elements. If you want to approach it stealthy, you can. But I like how the game will kind of adjust to your play style. If you're playing stealthy, the enemy AI will take that into consideration and how they approach, you know, how they uh, approach the mission, you know, as how you play. So uh, I'm really curious to see how this game plays out with its AI. And uh, it looks very futuristic, and I dig that. And um, so, yeah, I'll be streaming that Tuesday night. Sweet. There's a light and dark element in this game, too. So mm-hmm. your your movements are only tracked when you're in the light. When it goes dark, like anything goes. So if you want to shoot the place up or <laughs> do any, any any do any number of things, you can do that. And the uh, the echoes or the copies won't be able to to mimic those movements. So uh, yeah, re- really interesting looking title. Hope I can catch the the video on that at some point. I think when that one when it goes dark, it's rebooting the AI. So that's mm-hmm. updating yep. them to like your latest the way you're playing the missions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I'm, I'm intrigued because it, like it sounds like the only they are they're only going to be able to do the same things that you have done. So it's kind mm-hmm. of in how you handle your encounters with them that's going to determine how hard they're going to be. Mm-hmm. It could be entertaining. Yeah. It, it could be really entertaining. I'm curious to see what this game's about. Yeah, it's uh, it, it sounds like for, in that respect, there's going to be a heavy puzzle element to the game, trying to figure out how to guide these these echoes so that you can get to where you need to get to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so so really really interested to see that one. Uh, moving on from there, we got Always Sometimes Monsters, which is a uh, it's like a it's like a pixel art, eight bit sixteen bit adventure game. This is from Devolver Digital, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Frankie, you know a little bit about this one, don't you? A little bit. Um, it looks like this. This you're you're playing as a guy. Everything is going wrong for you. Um, I think you mm-hmm. lose your job. You get evicted from your apartment. Your uh, your the love of your life has left you and is marrying somebody else. Jeez. So I think uh, I think the the whole goal of the game is to kind of get to the wedding to stop it and mm-hmm. get your life back on track. But you're doing a lot of random busy work, task work in in the interim. So. Sounds like it's about an eight-hour game, though. You're just kind of running around doing. Uh, you have to do like work or chores or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you have to like. There's a little survival meter, so you have to like eat food to <laughs> be able to do stuff and and whatnot. But yeah, I think your ultimate goal is to try to stop this uh, this wedding. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, just just watching and reading about it seems like it uh, it has the potential to be a cool game. So mm-hmm. I'd be I'd be interested to learn more about that one. We've got uh, Revolve, which is kind of futuristic cycle side-scrolling game. Alteric, which I think looks really cool. It's a minimalistic, like a uh, 2D platformer with a cool aesthetic. It's got some boss battles in there. You control this little square as you're moving around these levels. Stereo Area is a uh, is a fun game to say, and it's it's basically like an amplitude rhythm kind of game. Uh, Fort Defense Tower Defense game will be out this week. White Noise Two, the uh, asymmetric four uh, v one horror game will be out on Friday the thirteenth as well. Cyber Dimension Neptunia 4 Goddesses Online is coming to retail. No mention of, of PSN on that, so I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Uh, Miku Gaku Monogatari Kai, Kaide Katie, however you say that episode. What the hell that's is a, this called? That's a Wednesday release. Uh, Miku <laughs> Gaku Monogatari. Okay. Kade, Katie episode something. Uh, so that's out on Wednesday. It's like a stars chibi like characters in a, in a, uh, like adventure game. Uh, Tuhu Kabuto 5 Burst Battle. It's coming to digital and retail this week. It's got 1v1 bullet hell fighting kind of game. Interesting looking title. And then uh, I forgot all about this, but WWE 2K18 has one of these early access editions. This game's actually going to be available on Friday if you have the deluxe edition of the game pre-ordered. So um, be on the lookout for that. Any guys interested in, in WWE 2K18? Nope. No. Yeah, I haven't, haven't played a wrestling game since PS2 days, so... Um, probably better that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like one of the first SmackDown games on PS2, that was the last one I played, which was you know, 15 years ago now, 20 years ago, who knows. Yeah, um, I think the last one I messed around with was like 2K14, and it, they, it, they've just changed so much. They're going mm-hmm. too realistic for me, and the, the way the <laughs> grappling system works, it just it's lost on me. Gotcha. So if you are looking forward to that, check it out on Friday. Um, a game we mentioned before, Summon Night 6, the retail release uh, actually coming out this week. So Summon Night 6 Lost Borders will be available in retail. Uh, GT Sport, getting a really interesting limited time demo. It'll be available Monday the 9th through uh, Thursday the 12th. And any of the progress that you have during the demo will actually carry over to the main game, which is cool. So the cars you unlock, the money you earn, all that will transfer over to the main game when that launches next week. Um, they also announced the track list for the game, which is is some 40, uh, 40 or so variations of the different tracks that are in the game. So it should be a pretty a pretty meaty uh, list there. Just Dance 2018 has a demo on the PSN now. Injustice 2, uh, the Raiden DLC, is available now. And of course, the Black Lightning character skin available alongside that. Black Bolt's available in Marvel Heroes Omega. So if you want to grab him, that pack is available. Uh, keeping up with the comic book theme here, Riddled with Crime, available now in DC Universe Online. Which adds some cool stuff to that game based around the Riddler. Dead by Daylight gets its Leatherface character. Uh, Overwatch, the Halloween Terror event, starts this Tuesday. And 18 new games have hit PS Now this week. Uh, many of them themed around like uh, Halloween and, and that kind of stuff. So These are all PS4 games as well. So Dead Island Definitive Edition, The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, Soma, 
Deadlight Director's Cut, Divinity Original Sin, Blood Bowl 2, The Swapper, Tukai and Kiwami, The Witch in the Hundred Night Revival Edition, Akiba's Trip, Undead and Undressed, Lone Survivor, The Director's Cut, Overlord, Fellowship of Evil, Tokyo Twilight Ghost Hunters, Daybreak Edition, Whispering Willows, a uh, game that I remember mm. you playing, Brent. Extreme mm. Exorcism, Sticks Master of Shadows, a Frankie Ayler joint, Technomancer, and Agatha Christie, the ABC Murders, all available on PS Now. Um, so, bringing lots of lots of PS4 titles over. So be on the lookout for that. Let's get into PSVR now. We have Raw Data VR, which is a very cool looking game, um, like this kind of epic sci-fi adventure game lots of action involved um really really interested to see more about that one that'll be out on tuesday the invisible hours is a game from tequila works this is another game trust game frankie you know much about this one looks like a really Uh, cool game yeah it's it sounds like it was inspired by clue i was gonna say it looks exactly like clue Mm -hmm. so (laughs) it's like it looks like the movie clue Yeah. yeah murder mystery vr game from tequila works i'm in that's awesome yeah, looks like a lot of fun. That's available at uh, both digital and at retail. Really curious to see more about that one. Uh, Radial G Racing Evolved, uh, Racing Revolved, seriously looks like a game that's gonna make me hurl. It's uh, it's just <laughs> a uh, a futuristic racing all over the walls, uh, twisting all around. Looks looks cool, but man, that looks like that's gonna be a crazy one in VR. Uh, Anywhere VR is available now. This is another one of these kind of experimental applications for VR where you can basically transport yourself anywhere and it's like a it's like a relaxation app. So uh, I'll be curious to see what they add to this app in terms of the places that you can go to. That's kind of an interesting experiment there. And uh a note here, PlayStation VR demos returning to retailers very soon for the holidays. So um be on the lookout for that if you want to get in there and test out PSVR and see what that's all about. On the Vita side of things, got a busy week on that on that platform. Bad Apple Wars, uh, the latest visual novel, is coming over on Friday the 13th. Uh, Alteric is coming to Vita as well on Wednesday. Semispheres, a game that's been out on PS4 and other platforms, coming over to the Vita this week. Son of Scorgasm, how about that name, uh, is a <laughs> Wednesday release. That one looks kind of like Geometry Wars. Cool looking title. Square Boy vs. Bullies Arena Edition is an old style like 8-bit brawler. Side-scrolling brawler, two Hukabuto five burst battles on the Vita as well. Summon Night Six Lost Borders coming to retail, uh, coming to retail for the Vita this week. Thirty Six Fragments of Midnight is available now, and uh, the Pinball Arcade Season Six hit up the Vita as well, so that's available now on Xbox this week. Of course, Middle Earth: Shadow of War will be on there on Tuesday, alongside Raid World War Two Danger Zone, which is a game I wasn't too impressed with when I played it on the Spotlight. Uh, another speaking of games that don't look good, Danger Zone's a, a terrible looking game. Um, <laughs> but so, some people have enjoyed it. Some people have fun with it. If you like the crash mode and burnout, you know it's it's there's a lot of similarities there, and you can you know you can have a good time with it. I just uh, it just wasn't for me. Uh, Shiny's a Wednesday release puzzle platformer on October 11th. Decay the Mare, it's like a first person horror survival game. That's out on Friday. The Evil Within 2, of course, will be there on Friday alongside Friday the 13th, the retail version. WWE 2K18's Deluxe Edition will be on Xbox as well. You know, and a couple things we failed to mention last week. We actually didn't mention Battle Chasers was coming to Xbox as well. So just just a note that's available on there as well. The uh, uh, the retail release is actually pushed up to this week too on there. I don't know why, but retail okay. release will be on Tuesday. Cool. Um, so you have that. Arcade Archives Neo Geo Metal Slug X is available on there now, alongside Ninja Showdown. Overwatch's Halloween event starts Tuesday. The Injustice 2 Raiden DLC, the Black Bolt DLC, and the Riddled with Crime DLC, all available on Xbox as well, uh, as Leatherface from Dead by Daylight in the Just Dance 2018 demo on there as well. Let's get into Nintendo now. It's what we missed last week, Stardew Valley. Of course, like you mentioned, Bender. You know, on the last show, Brent, we talked about the release of that game. was was very close. Little did we know how close it was. So it was. It actually came out on Thursday, so it's available on there now. Earth Atlantis, a cool looking like underwater shooter, that's available on there now for fourteen ninety nine. Metal Slug X is on there for seven ninety nine, and the Just Dance twenty eighteen demo now available this week for the Switch. We've got Tuhu Kabuto five burst battle on there as well. Uh, Eighty eight Heroes ninety eight Heroes edition, which is a, is, a, is a funny name for that game. Um, 
this is a, a game that that I thought had a had a cool concept when I played it on the PS4. The concept was not executed as well as it could have been. Don't know how much is changing for the Switch. You know, they're adding some new heroes. They're adding a couple new stages. So, uh, um, you know, if you're so inclined, check that one out. Tiny Barbarian DX is uh, is an interesting looking title as well. That'll be out on Tuesday. Side scrolling action game. Yolo and the Celestial Elephants. That's got to be the best name game of the week. That's that's hitting the eShop on Thursday for fifteen bucks. Wolverblade, I think it looks badass. That game's coming out on Thursday, October twelfth, nineteen ninety nine. Very cool art style, side scrolling like beat 'em up, uh very gory graphic game. Kind of a medieval Viking type of a setting. But uh really, really like what I seen from that one. Um and the Flame and the Flood Complete Edition will also be out this week on the Switch for fifteen bucks. On the Wii, what missed last week? The Just Dance 2018 demo was about it. Nothing this week, and uh, nothing to speak of for the 3DS either. Wow, that was a quick new release list right there, buddy. Just uh, yeah, bang through it. Awesome, good stuff. All right, well, let's jump into the news. Let's talk some Destiny 2. Bungie has revealed information on Destiny 2's first Iron Banner, and guys, we got to talk about this. Uh, on the website, they're talk- they're on Bungie's website, they listed what's different about the Iron Banner in Destiny 2. Well, here's what they listed. Combat will be, will be between two teams of four players. Uh, your fighting abilities, not your power level, will decide the outcome. Bounties and ranks have been replaced with Iron Banner Ingram. Let's go back to that second one, though, guys. Your uh, fighting abilities, not your power levels, will decide the outcome. Now, this is different because in Destiny 1, the Iron Banner was all about the light advantage. All the gear that you locked, everything came into play. That doesn't appear to be the case now. So my my question is to you guys, how is Iron Banner any different than Crucible, other than the, the Iron Banner Engram? I mean, it's control, but there's no power differences. Can someone explain to me how this is different than Crucible? Bender, any idea? No idea. In fact, that was my question when I heard about this, too. I was like, I thought that was the whole point of Iron Banner, is that it was the, the one mode that you could jump into where where your power level matters. So now it doesn't, so, I mean, it's just another Crucible mode. So, I mean, I guess you're going for specific rewards that you wouldn't normally get in the, in the regular Crucible modes, but still, it just doesn't seem different enough now. Mm-hmm. Frankie, I know you were you, you became a big fan of the Iron Banner in Destiny 1. What's your thoughts on this? I mean, isn't the power level, isn't that the crux of Iron Banner? Isn't that the point of it? Yeah, I, it's it's really confusing because I think Trials also was level-based in the first one, and it's not this time around. So mm-hmm. I, unless they're going to use it to roll out new maps or something, so we'll be playing on a new map all week. I don't know. Probably not. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm confused about why you would drop the level advantages, especially at this point, because everyone is already level 20, nearing power level 300, so Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to have a lot of, like, disadvantages going in there. You're going to have a shit ton of mighty multi-tools, though. Oh, yeah, you have a lot of those. Uh, Ben, you know, those guys touched on some interesting points. Um, You know, we played the Iron Banner. We always liked the the advantages. It was actually... I actually enjoyed it because I like going in there and beating other people with higher power levels. I I felt like a badass. I was like, oh, that's awesome. I just knocked out a guy who was like three light levels ahead of me. I felt really good about that. We're not going to have that this time around. Dude, what's your thoughts on this no no power ability? Uh, I'm very disappointed in this. And here's the thing, man. Destiny is a game that's all about the loot that you get. All right? That's the whole point of the game. That's why we play the game. We play it to, to see what exotics we can get, to see what armor we can get, to see how we can deck out our character, to see what the next gun that we can get, like that next power level that we can hit. It's all about building up your character through the, the different systems that are in the game. Now, Iron Banner was a way for you to show off that work. It was a way for you to go in there and be like, look look at the badass guardian that I made. Hey, look at the guns I've been able to achieve. Look at the work I've put in through the raid and through everything else that you can do in the game. Look at the power level that I've been able to reach. So it was a way for you to get in there and really display your custom guardian and and you know show off all the hard work that you've done in the game. So by by taking the iron banner and removing the the level advantages and just simply having it you know be just your your fighting skills or fighting abilities or whatever the term that they used here. You know like you guys said it just kind of it defeats the whole purpose of the iron banner. It's simply just a crucible match, uh, a a 
control crucible match with you competing for different you know rewards than you were previously that's that's really all it is and it just it takes away the whole unique feel that the iron banner had now so um i'm i'm really disappointed with with the way that they're doing that i'm honestly i'm disappointed they did that with trials as well so no, no matter how much we suck or, or how much we get our ass kicked when we go into there, that was one of the cool things about Trials too. This was the ultimate end game activity. And you had to be at the top of your game with the best stuff that you could conjure up to go in there and have a fighting chance. So mm -hmm. I got to believe that there's a lot of people, a lot of Trials diehards that are disappointed with the way that Bungie's done that as well. So theoretically, you could go in there. I could walk in there with a, you know, with a blue gun and, and do some, some, some work or hell, a green gun. Give me a, an uncommon gun. I could go in there and, and do some work on people that have put hours and hours and are level like 300 characters in the game. So I, I just... This is, this is one of the issues with, with Destiny 2 right now. There was a really, really good article on Kotaku a week or two ago where they, they laid out this kind of weird middle ground that Destiny 2 is trying to, to find themselves in. So the, the first game was criticized for how grindy it was and... and you know, all the stuff that you had to do to get your level up, get the next gun, get the best gun, yada, yada, yada. And now with Destiny 2, it's it's not grindy enough for some people. And uh, it's it, in some ways it is and it, in, in some ways it isn't. So Bungie's trying to walk this line between the people who were put off by the first game and for the people who were absolutely, you know, enthralled with the first game. So they're, they're trying to please both sides of the coin at the same time. And in some respects, they're they're failing and Iron Banner and Trials and taking out the level advantages, like this is one of them. You know, when I, I, uh, I've talked about this a little bit before, but as a player of Destiny 1, as somebody who played that game so much for the last three years, there's certain things that I do miss from that game. Like I miss some of the customization options from like guns. So, uh, you know, with the first Destiny, when you got a gun, the first thing you did was you pulled it up, you looked at the perks, you saw what what was available on that gun, what you could level up, like how that gun was going to look when you eventually got done with it. In Destiny 2, I don't even look at the perks half the time when I get a gun. I just forget that they're there because you can't do anything with them. So, uh, you know, I, I miss some of the customization and some of the some of the stuff that goes along with that. Now, once you hit level 270 or, or whatever it is in Destiny 2, it, there the grind is there. So the people that love the grind, like that's there at the end of Destiny 2. So, you know, they that's one of the ways that they've... They've kind of laid that out for for Destiny One players, but I don't know, man. I, I don't I don't want to just keep rambling on about this here, but it, th with with Destiny, they're trying to walk a line, and I don't think they're succeeding on all fronts. Iron Banner to me is a is a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you. I think the reason that it, it it just seems strange is because look, yes, it's not as grindy as the first one. At least I don't think so, not yet, anyways. But you know, I'm up to 292, and I feel like it's 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 been a good grind, and I like that because. I'm grinding so I can compete in the Nightfall. I'm grinding so I can be competitive in the raid. Mm -hmm. But now you've kind of just completely removed the reason to grind for PvP. You've got the reason to grind in PvE, and the Iron Banner was the reason to grind for PvP. But now you don't have that. What's the point of getting to, to, to light level 300 for PvP? What, where does light level, even, what does all that grinding have to do anything in PvP anymore? Where's the reward for that? The reward for grinding in PvE is being able to do the Nightfall, to be able to beat the Nightfall, to be able to run the raid, to be able to run uh, the prestige version of the raid and the Nightfall. That's the point of that's that's the reward you get for grinding. There's nothing there for, for for PvP now. Like grinding has absolutely nothing to do with PvP. You can jump in there and play it any mode you want. That's what I think is disappointing, Mob, because the Iron Banner was the reward for your grind, for the efforts that you put into the game. That's what's disappointing about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, man. I know they're trying to uh, appeal to as many people as possible, and they're trying to make these activities available to as many people as possible, but, like, Iron Banner and Trials are not activities that should be available to everyone. That's what you have the regular Crucible for. <laughs> so, if I just wanted to get in there and play a regular control match, I can do that with, uh, with the Quick Play playlist, but... You know, to then reduce Iron Banner to that as well, it just, yeah, it just really loses a lot of its luster now. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I agree with you 100%, man. It, it's it's strange. And hopefully it's something they won't uh, they'll look back at. Um, you know, but hey, you know, we might jump in there and find it really fun, but I just feel like it's just it's just more Crucible, which I don't have a problem with. I like Crucible, but I always like that unique 
crux of Iron Banner. Yeah, there but, and, there, uh, and there's no doubt it'll be fun. I mean, Control is fun. It, it'll mm-hmm. it'll be fun to get in there with you guys and play the Iron Banner and and go through and and earn some of this gear. The the armor looks absolutely sick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the yeah, the Iron Banner looks armor really looks awesome. So it's gonna be fun to get in there and get that stuff. But yeah, there's just there's always gonna be that that little bit of luster that's not gonna be here. And I gotta believe that many other people are gonna have this this same feedback. And you know. I'm, Maybe it's different, like you said. Once we jump in there, maybe maybe we have a different opinion of it after the fact. But I gotta believe a lot of people are feeling like we're feeling, and eventually, this is maybe something that Bungie looks at down the line. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you, you know, what's in it for you if you do the Iron Banner? First, you can earn Iron Banner tokens in every match. You earn more if you win. Daily and season milestones that track your progress to glory, and claim brand new armor wrote in the forges of the Iron Lords, and then um. Obviously, how can you compete? Just simply compete, uh, complete the Destiny 2 campaign. That's the only way to reach the tower anyways. Visit Lord Saladin in the tower to begin the Iron Banner quest and fight in the Iron, ba- Iron Banner playlist with quick play modes and matchmaking. So that's how you, you'll be able to just jump right into it. Visit Lord Saladin. He'll give you the Iron Banner quest, and you're off and running doing the quick play modes and matchmaking. So um, another, uh, another one of our buddies making it to the tower now. Yes, Lord Saladin shall return. Be good to see him uh, once again. I mean, we only saw him for a split second in the campaign at the very beginning, mm-hmm. in uh, in the uh, homecoming mission. I think that's that's the only time we saw Lord Saladin, isn't it? No, that was that was that, Shax. Was, that was Shax. Yeah, we haven't. Oh, that was Shax. Yeah, we haven't Saladin. seen Saladin. Yet. We haven't seen Saladin at all. Oh, oh, it'll be good to see him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that uh, Destiny wants you to keep an eye out on is later this week, or no, is it this week or next week? Uh, it's next week, the twentieth. Mm-hmm. Um, at the, uh, the Destiny, is it TwitchCon? Yeah. There'll be a Destiny panel where they're going to discuss the seasons of Destiny. Ben, what, uh, what, what are you expecting from this, man? Do you think this is going to touch on the seasons in terms of the clan seasons? Or is there going to be something else here? No, th- yeah, that's exactly what they're getting at here. So they're, we're going to learn what do seasons mean in Destiny 2, what will change from season to season, how many seasons we can expect, and when does season 2 begin? So um, all of that stuff will be explained. You know, we we have our, our thoughts and, and ideas on how some of that might work just by following our clan and watching our progress and whatnot. I would imagine that once we reach the end of Season 1, like our progress is going to reset. We're going to have a whole new set of, of goals to achieve and emblems to earn and that kind of – or engrams to earn and that kind of stuff from, from some of the different – you know milestones that we reach but that's just all you know that's just all guessing and 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 conjecture at this point so it'll be interesting though to actually hear from Bungie about about what it all means and that's something that's that's something I really like about Destiny 2 I love the clan like it's the way mm-hmm. they have that set up that really gives you uh, like a meta thing to work towards that I think is really cool so glad to see that they're going to be expanding on that and the season sounds like an interesting idea that um, uh, I'm honestly re- really uh really excited to learn more about Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm expecting them to talk about spe- specifically the tier rewards. I think those will change. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those you know, every time you rank up to a new tier, you unlock some kind of a new perk that the clan can enjoy. Mm-hmm. And uh, shout out to the Short Pause Guardians. Man, we're we're making our way up to uh, level five here. We're we're about ha- I think we're about almost two thirds of the way through level four. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're making our way through it pretty good. We should hit the uh, level f- uh, the next level before the reset. And then, um, yeah. So good, good job, Guardians. You guys are you guys are kicking ass out there. Indeed. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And then, uh, lastly, boys, we got some new Destiny Two figures. What uh, what are these all about? McFarlane giving us some uh, the next round of figures, and as anticipated, they uh, they look sweet. <laughs> so, mm. did did you guys buy any of the uh, the other ones? I have all four. Bought all four of them. Sweet. Mm-hmm. So I never did. Wanted to. Never did. <laughs> Do you know yeah. there's store exclusive variants? Mm. Yeah, with different armor. I mean, there's different versions. Yeah, like really. Target has an exclusive Titan figure. I think they have a King's Fall like armor. Mm. Oh, where can we find the Chatter White one? Mm. <laughs> I think they cheaped out on that one. But <laughs> yeah, there's uh there's variants. I don't know who the other retailers are, but there's a Hunter and a Warlock that have different gear. So. Hmm. Really wish you wouldn't have told me that. <laughs> really wish you wouldn't have told me that. Yeah, uh, the cool <laughs> the cool thing about this wave is it's the Vanguard leaders. So it's Cade, Ikora, and and Zavala. So oh, wow. those oh, be uh, nice. those be cool cool figures to add to the collection. 
Yeah, I'm going to try to grab those. I'm going to try to get all these uh, figurines of the Destiny stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Did you see that Saladin one? Yes. It's mm-hmm. huge. I think that's the one that I got. That's the other one that I have over here. I just got it recently. That's a big one, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's bigger than the other three. Yeah, nice. Thing's yeah, awesome. It's huge. That thing looks awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> and I'm pretty awesome for having it, right? You are. Yeah. Yay me. Yeah. <laughs> Yay me. Well, uh, we'll go from Destiny 2 to something lame. Let's go to some fighting <laughs> game news. Let's go, man. Get some uh, yeah, some interesting nuggets this week. So, Franklin, this will be, uh, be me and you as it normally is during this fighting talk. <laughs> um, so, we talked about Street Fighter V Arcade Edition. It was rumored. It showed up on... Uh, Whatever shop to or whatever site we, we pulled it from, don't remember exactly which site it ended up on. But Street Fighter V Arcade Edition has been officially announced this week. It's coming January 16th, and <clears throat> as anticipated, it will house basically the, the entire Street Fighter V um, you know, uh, saga so far. You'll have all the characters from Season 1 and Season 2. There's still, more, there's still one more character that has to be revealed for Season 2, so there'll be 28 characters. They're also going to introduce a second V trigger for each character, so it's going to significantly change the strategy involved. Uh, as the as the name of the game suggests, there'll be an arcade mode in there as well. So <laughs> many people have been waiting for this one for a while. There's uh, there's an extra battle mode, a, a new gallery, uh, a UI design overall, lots of new stuff that they're doing for this game. And also as anticipated, this will all be coming to the base version of Street Fighter V as well for uh you know as as a free in-game update so um so my my question to you about this frankie we talked about this before but some people are upset because they're releasing an arcade edition of this game because um you know capcom said you know quote unquote we're not releasing any additional editions of this game now i i understand that but this is a much different situation than from street fighter 2 to Super Street Fighter 2, or from Street Fighter 4 to Super Street Fighter 4. This is not a different game. This is the same exact game that you already own. It's being updated for free, and if you want to, you know, if you have the season passes for the characters, like you have all these characters already, this is simply a way for Capcom to re-release this game, a game which, which as a fighting fan, you want this game to get as, in as many, as many people's hands as possible, because it, it started off with a rough launch, so to me, it makes sense almost two years into the life of this game. It has a very, very healthy uh, competitive scene for Street Fighter V right now. So let's now try to remarket this to everyone else. Let's bring it out at thirty nine ninety nine. Market it as the arcade edition. Include all of this stuff. And they their original promise still remains. There's still only one version of Street Fighter V. This is just the complete version of this game. Like we see with many of these complete editions of games, whether whether uh, when they come out and have all the DLC included. So this is just has more in line with that than what we've seen from Street Fighter in the past. So personally, I don't understand the people that are upset by this. To me, this is exciting. You're getting all this stuff as a Street Fighter V player for free in the base game, and you have a chance to bring a whole new audience into the game by remarketing this, resetting it out to retail, and, and bringing it in at a price that people can be excited about. So help me out here, man. What am I missing? What are people upset about with this? People are being upset, man. That's the thing now. <laughs> That's what you do. You get upset. <laughs> but, Literally, um, like people just not paying attention to what this is. Probably. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> um, I know at first like I was kind of annoyed just because they had gone out of their way to say we're not going to do this again. But I, I should have learned by now never to listen to them because they're going to do an ultimate, a super, an arcade, whatever. They're going to do another edition, another disc version of the game um honestly a lot of me is you know now that i've had time to think about it i think you're right i think it's it's a good time for them to get out there you know like when that game released it had a stigma around it because of how bare bones it was Mm -hmm. people were out there you know oh well unless you're gonna play online you don't need to buy that game it doesn't have a story mode doesn't have arcade ladders you're not putting a game out there that has arcade in the title you know it has the arcade ladders you know they've added a story you know this game has kind of come together and essentially turned into the game that I think a lot of people wanted it to when it launched. Mm-hmm. Um, so getting out there, picking it up, I assume all the, the other characters are included with it as well. Yep. So you have a pretty healthy roster of fighters in there now too. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a it's a great incentive for people who've been maybe holding off on this game. Um, obviously, especially people who collect physical games, having a more complete version of this game on a disc is great. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, I, I do. I hope people look at this, you know, those have been who have been holding out. You know, thirty nine ninety nine, that's uh you know, thirty one ninety nine Amazon Prime or Best Buy rewards. So Indeed. I, I it's 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 a tough 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 game to pass up. It's a lot of fun. So I think mm-hmm. the season passes too for the characters have been like forty bucks a pop, so or not forty bucks, it's thirty bucks a pop. Yeah. So you're again, if you haven't bought the game yet, you're getting the base game and essentially paying for one, you know, mm-hmm. a character pack and getting everything. So Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I love uh I love having fighting games on my hard drive. I like being able to just pull them up and get, get in a few matches. So I've been actually eyeing Street Fighter V to add to, to to my digital collection. And if I can get the arcade edition for thirty nine ninety nine when this comes out and get the season passes included with that, like this is going to be something I do when when this comes out. Because I've I've kind of held off on the season passes. Haven't haven't bought any of those yet. Been kind of waiting for the right moment. There's been several times where they've been on sale and I just haven't pulled the trigger for whatever reason. So. It seems like a perfect time to get in there and get the whole complete package and get this on the hard drive. But, uh, you know, the the fighting system in Street Fighter V was never the issue. It's always been a top-tier fighting system. It's always been a top-tier fighting game. And it's been interesting to watch the game evolve. You know, like you said, it, it started out as a as a bare-bones product from a just commercial and uh, uh, casual perspective. But the game is, is very healthy in the in the fighting scene. Street Fighter uh, fighters and fans are are really into Street Fighter Five, and there's a lot of really good competition that's going on around the game right now. So the the kind of hardcore crowd has built up this game, and then slowly but surely, you've been adding the story modes, adding new characters, and now we're getting to the point where we're gonna have this arcade mode with the extra battle mode with all the stuff that they're throwing into the game. This is a pretty robust experience that you're gonna be able to get for forty for forty dollars now, come January sixteenth when this comes out. So. uh yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this, uh, that it's going to bring in a, a whole new crowd of people that have been holding out for this game. And, and you know, the people that that have already been playing the game, they're going to get some cool updates as well. So I'm all, I'm all on board with the uh, with the Arcade Edition. Once again, that's January 16th, 2018. Be on the lookout for that. Now, Franklin, we got our first peek into Fighter Pack 3 for Injustice 2. And we saw the Atom. Now, uh, Ed Boon has has told us that this is not the official trailer for the Atom. This trailer was sweet, though, man. Like watching the Atom <laughs> in action, watching him shrink and grow and do all his different uh, his different size moves. He looks like he's gonna be a really really cool fighter for somebody to get in there and and really figure out uh, wrap their head around. So we saw like a brief like forty five second trailer for him. It was uh, kind of revealed ahead of of the New York Comic Con, which is going on right now. But uh, eventually we're going to get a full-on trailer for the Atom, and eventually we're going to find out who the rest of the fighters in Fighter Pack 3 are. But uh, what did you think of what we saw from the Atom, man? Uh, it looks awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I laugh because like a lot of the uh, character reveals, they do the, uh, the um, clash moves. It's always mm-hmm. against Robin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it so, just because he has a sword and it just looks cool? I, I think that's that's got to be it. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably. Or it's just their punching bag. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Adam looks sweet, man. Watching him like shrink down, you see a little ball zipping around the flash. Yeah, you know, you zoom in on him, he's like punch him in the face. It, <laughs> it looks like a really cool character to play as. Yeah, it's cool to watch his combos too, because he's constantly like changing his size as he's going through these combos. So like punch you in the face a couple times as regular Adam, shrink down, slap you in the face, grow big, slam you into the ground. Like it, <laughs> it's really it's really cool to watch in action. So I uh, yeah. I think I think he's gonna be a really fun fighter to to get in there and and play with and and probably watch like some of these professional guys play as well. Looks mm-hmm. like uh, looks like he's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, just one note here to the uh, the patch. The latest patch for Injustice 2 has been released released a few days ago. There was an issue where um, after the last patch came out before this one, some of the gear that you had was was disappearing for whatever reason. So this new patch has addressed that. So if you've been holding out because that issue was, was cropping up, that has not been fixed. So you can get in there and earn your gear and be, f- be, uh, be merry and have fun. Mm-hmm. The last thing that we need to address here, Franklin, an interesting report came out this week that... Uh, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite had a shockingly low budget. The budget, um, this this comes via uh, Liam Robertson, who, uh, who does some of this stuff, kind of dives into these games and, and finds out some of these interesting details about it. But the budget for this game was <laughs> was is said to be half of Street Fighter V's downloadable content budget, less than half. The budget was slight, or uh, sorry, slightly more than half of what was put into Street Fighter V's downloadable content. Which which is incredible. So we 
not even Street Fighter V itself, but the DLC for Street Fighter V. This is slightly more than half of that budget. And, um, you know, some people have taken issue with some of the designs of this game. Once again, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite is a game where it's been praised for its fighting system, and people really love the fighting system, but it's some of this other stuff around it that, that people are, are uh, not in love with. So, um, you know, I, I know it's gotten off to, to a bit of a, of a slow start in that regard, and I hope, like, Street Fighter V... Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite will continue to build itself up because I, I really do love the Marvel vs. Capcom series and I want to see this be successful so that you know this is something that that is in the fighting game community for a long time to come. So hopefully after this slow start, the the Marvel vs. Capcom professional community will rally behind this game. They'll build it up much like they did Street Fighter V. And it sounds like they have a really cool DLC plan ahead. I mean, Black Panther. Black Panther looks freaking sweet, man. I don't know if you watched that trailer, but he looks he looks wicked. Sigma looks awesome. Um, and Sigma, Black Panther, and Monster Hunter will, will all be out next week, so they'll be ready to go on the on the seventeenth. Um, what do you think about this, Frankie? What do you think about when you hear that Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite was developed on a budget slightly more than half of Street Fighter V's DLC budget? That's that's weird. Um, it also kind of makes me wonder about maybe it's, that's why we don't see a lot of the characters we were expecting. Like maybe they just didn't want to go out and pay the licensing fees for like the X Men. Yeah. So it, that might explain some of the ros like the roster cuts that people are noticing and kind of upset about. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy though. Like I think that game looks pretty polished for apparently the budget behind it. So yeah, it's I mean, crazy. And when you put that in the in the perspective, it's uh it's pretty crazy with the game that they've been able to create, which is a uh you know an ultra smooth sixty frames like uh, fast paced Marvel vs. Capcom fighting game with a uh with a cast of of pretty sweet characters. Honestly, I mean there's a lot of new characters in here. I uh, personally didn't have a problem with them diving into the the Marvel Cinematic Universe as their base because there's so many new characters that they didn't have in there before, like like we're going to see from Black Panther and, and Black Widow and Winter Soldier and these DLC. Like Those are awesome Marvel characters that we're going to get into this game now. So I never had a problem with that. But, uh, yeah, so so just just really interesting to uh, to see how this is all playing out. Hopefully, like I said, hopefully this game will catch on. It'll have legs. Capcom will continue to support it. But the fact that it's got such a small budget that it took to develop it makes me think that it's going to be that much easier for this game to be successful for them, right? I mean, if it had such hopefully. a small budget, it seems like it wouldn't take much for them to recoup that. And, uh, yeah, the the fighting game community, I have no doubt, is going to rally behind this game because many, many people do love the fighting system that's on display here. It's unique. It's a little bit different than what we've seen in Marvel vs. Capcom prior. So I think people are going to rally behind that, and I'm looking forward to watching this game competitively as as we move through the uh, through the weeks and months here. Brent, mm -hmm. take it away. Awesome, thank you, fellas. Uh, one story before we go to break here: um, Unsung Story is now coming to PlayStation Four, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is a tactical RPG that. Um, was was kickstarted kickstarted like what three or four years ago? Yeah, like early 2014. Yeah, uh, way back when. But uh, publisher Little Orbit has announced the expansion into the home console market, despite not making the stretch goals put in place in 2014. Uh, the campaign has been removed so from some previous options for platforms such as Kindle and Windows Tablet, as well as some physical rewards due to insufficient backers uh, for those options. But um, I don't know much about this game, but it's it's interesting to see that it's making it to it, it's coming to consoles despite not making that stretch goal three years ago, um, and and and, it, and that makes it even weirder because this game was funded three years ago, and you know the game hasn't released anywhere, and now it's coming to consoles as well. Where that extra funding come from to to be able to hit other consoles? That's 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 impressive. So. Yeah. Um, don't know much about this game. Boys, do you know anything about this game? I'm in, I'm in the same boat as you, man. And, and the thing about this game is it's always been pegged as the spiritual successor to Final Fantasy Tactics, which mm -hmm. in many people's opinions is the greatest tactical role-playing game ever created. So already out the gate, Unsung Story had a huge like burden on its shoulders. Like, look, this is the game that's that's being compared to Final Fantasy Tactics. They have the, uh, what is it, the director? Yeah, they have the director of Final Fantasy Tactics that's helping them develop this game. So, um, so they have the the kind of the weight of the the tactical RPG world on their shoulders, and like you said, man, it's just it's it's really strange that you know we're almost four years into the 
into the end of the Kickstarter here. We don't know anything that's going on with this game. They didn't hit the the extra goals they were looking to hit to bring this to consoles. And now they're adding in the PS4, Xbox One, and Switch without having even finished the, any other versions of this game. So it makes me wonder, like, what, where is this coming from? Is Is this... Are you being too ambitious? Is this something you're going to be able to do? Like, are we close to actually seeing this game? Like, I, I, I don't really know, man. I've like, Even with this announcement, there's no, like, trailers or anything for us to see. Nothing. There's nothing for us to see tangibly on this game. So all we have is the is the very cool idea of a spiritual successor to Final Fantasy Tactics, and that's all we're kind of holding on to and going off of here. So I don't really know what to think of this, man. It's It's strange, to say the least. Yeah. It's not often you hear of a of this uh, like a, a game that's been in development since being kickstarted four years uh, three years ago almost four years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, now they're just they're adding more consoles to it. That that's interesting. Yeah. So, but uh, hopefully we'll hear about more of that from uh f- from them uh, in 2018. But hey, we're gonna take a quick break. We've got some music here from Ruel Ethan, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thanks again to Ruel Ethan for producing the music for the podcast. He did the opening, the closing, the music you heard right there. Follow him on Twitter, at Ruel Ethan. Check him out on SoundCloud and iTunes. All right, Mr. Boyce, let's hop into some PlayStation news. What's going on in the world of PlayStation, buddy? Let's do it. So our first story here, interesting. We got a, a little shakeup in the, in the management for uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment. So uh, Andrew House, the PlayStation president and global CEO, will be stepping down from his role and current deputy president, John uh, Suyoshi Kadera, will be taking his place effective immediately. So um, this is via IGN's article, and this is from the official Sony press release. But House will remain with uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment as chairman for the year for transitional purposes, and he will stick with Sony as director and chairman of SIE. So, quote, this is from House. I'm tremendously proud of what we've built with PlayStation and Sony Interactive Entertainment. 
entertaining millions globally with the best in games and creating a fully-fledged digital entertainment company. PlayStation has been a huge part of my life for more than 20 years, but with the business having achieved record-breaking success, now seemed to be the right time for me to pursue new challenges. I shall always treasure the friendships and people that have made SIE such a wonderful place to work. I'm also grateful to PlayStation fans and gamers around the world for their loyalty and support. John and the team at SIE are world class, and I know the future of PlayStation is very bright. So, um, House been with the company since 1990 now. He uh, oh. took the PlayStation reins in 2011, so he's been with PlayStation since since Square One, basically. So, um, yeah, so so an interesting development here. Uh, Brent, what do, you, what do you think about this, man? Uh, what do you make of this, if if anything? To me, it just sounds like uh, like House is just um, no, he's just <laughs> basically he's he's achieved what he wanted to achieve with PlayStation, and mm-hmm. he's uh, probably gonna go spend some time with his family. Maybe pursue something that's not as as all consuming as being the the president of PlayStation. Don't know what the future holds for him, but he's been a mm-hmm. huge part of this of this company for the last twenty twenty five years. So uh, I don't know. What do you make of this? It's just like everything else in every other line of work, man. Yep. Whether it's sports, movies, you know, anything. You, you have you do something for so long, and you just need to change the change the scenery. You need something new to do. Obviously, he's been very successful at mm-hmm. Sony. He's helped PlayStation through some of the dark times, and has helped it, you know get back up to where they want to be, where they find it to be acceptable. And he's happy that he's been able to achieve what he's achieved. And it's just time to try something new. Nobody ever wants to work the same job for twenty, thirty years. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's you're always looking for when you when you when you constantly am just. Once a once a job starts to feel repetitive, you know you, you've worked so hard for so many years. Eventually, you're going to hit a point where you're, you're plateau and you're like, okay, I don't feel like I'm really doing anything more here. I don't know if there's anything else I can achieve. Mm-hmm. I want to try something else, and that's what he's doing here. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we uh, obviously we, we wish Andrew the best. Um, Franklin, you got any any thoughts on this? Uh, no, like Brent said, I just assume he's achieved everything he feels he's going to achieve where he is. You know, better to go out on top. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah, he's he's definitely earned it. So yeah, I mean, riding out, uh, riding out at, at at the peak of his game. You know, riding off like Barry Sanders. You know, oh. top top of his game. <laughs> had to man, it's still too soon for that had one. To, had to throw that one in there. Um, but I thought uh, uh, Jeff Keeley had a had a nice tweet about this. So I want to read this real quick. Things kind of sums things up nicely. Andy House was at PlayStation since the beginning, the mid '90s. He deeply cared about the brand. He embodied it, built it, and supported creators and storytellers at every turn. He made gaming cool and pushed this medium forward. Can't wait for what's next. So I thought that was uh, just a nice kind of summary of of some of the things that that Andy House has been involved in. No, as gamers, we only see the the president, Andrew House, who gets on stage for a few minutes at these press conferences in his suit and shows us a, a console or whatever. But we don't see like the, the the blood, sweat, and tears that he put in from the beginning with PlayStation and how he helped mm-hmm. kind of develop this to the to the juggernaut that it is right now to to the point where it's basically holding up Sony as a whole. Like PlayStation is like their most profitable brand and their like maiden business right now. So it's, it's pretty it's pretty incredible to uh, to be involved in that and like you said, just kind of a a great chance for him to step down as as they're kind of uh you know at the at their zenith. I do have one request. I do have one request. Can we get Andy House to just host the entire PlayStation experience? I want him to serenade was with his voice one more time. <laughs> I just want to hear his voice one more time for an entire show. That's all I want to hear. We'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on from there. So a quick note here. Uh, PS4 system software 5.0 is is out now. So most of us have, have uh, if not all of us, have already downloaded it. So obviously, you know, we talked about uh, previously the, the family system being overhauled, the enhanced Twitch broadcasting, so you can now do 1080p 60 frames on the PlayStation 4 Pro. There's some, uh, you know, kind of quality of life changes to notifications and messages. Um, some of the other things that have come out of this update are team tournaments, which is actually a, a pretty cool thing. Um, you can now join up, you can now join or own up to a maximum of 60 different teams, and each team will have an owner and captain or captains who can manage the team. Only teams will be able to register for official team tournaments. Your team will have its own customizable team page where you can see team member information and view upcoming and ongoing events that your team is currently registered for and competing in. 
In addition, you can easily check out your team's results in past tournaments with a new bracket viewer that shows full tournament standings for single and double elimination tournaments directly on the PS4. Communicating and coordinating with your teammates is also simple via the integrated team clan uh, team chat feature. So, uh, I, you know, this is um, not a not a huge thing, but I think it's it's a pretty cool thing to be able to set up your own team and get into these official tournaments. Games that currently support this are Uncharted 4, Lost Legacy, World of Tanks, Mantis Burn Racing, with with many more scheduled to get into this into the future. So, uh, might be something to keep our eye on. Um, mm-hmm. You can also follow anyone now on the PlayStation 4. This has been alluded to and talked about, but they no longer have to be verified accounts. Follow who you choose. Messages have been updated, so when you put links in there, they give you a, a thumbnail preview and a, and a brief description of the link when you put it in there. So something similar to kind of what we see when we put something in Discord. That will be available now through the messages. Um, the uh, Some of the other apps have been updated as well. The Communities app and the Messages app have been updated with some different stickers and whatnot. So... All in all, this isn't like a uh, this isn't like the advent of PSN name changes. This isn't adding in external storage or boost mode or any of these other like big things we've seen in the past. This is more just kind of quality of life updates for the system, and you know we'll kind of take them and run with them and, and move forward from there. Now, interesting story here came out this week about an updated PlayStation VR model. So mm-hmm. this is via IGN, this came out of came out of Japan. So Model number CUH ZVR2, as opposed to the original ZVR1, the new and updated headset features several improvements over the original version. The updated design means that the stereo headphone cables are now integrated with the headset, as well as a slimmer streamlined connection cable. Good news for anyone who spends their days fighting with the cables currently uh, with their PlayStation VR headset. Um, so IGN goes on. The updated processor unit also features HDR pass-through capability, mm-hmm. meaning meaning that PlayStation owners can now watch HDR PS4 content on their TV without having to disconnect the VR headset, although the headset will still need to be turned off. It's important to note that the processor units cannot be exchanged. The unit for the ZVR2 model will not be compatible with the ZVR1 mm-hmm. and vice versa. So, uh, Brent... We come over to you on this one. So your thoughts on this updated PlayStation VR model? Look, it doesn't take a lot of effort to go over and unplug the the HDMI and plug in the other one, but it's just a silly thing that you have to do, mm-hmm. and it pisses me off that this thing is coming out soon <laughs> because I'm going to want to trade in my current headset and all that stuff to get the new one because I... I I am lazy. I don't want to have to sit down. I get home from work. I want to just play a game. I just want to sit on the couch and turn it on, and I have to go over there and unplug one HDMI cable and plug in, and, and to plug in the other one. All my stuff is easily accessible. It's not hard to get to. It's just one of those little annoyances. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's just one of those little annoyances. And, uh, yeah, when I read – as soon as I see new model, immediately in my head I was like – here comes the HDR pass-through. <laughs> I don't even have to read the article. HDR pass-through. Here it comes. Go and read. There it is. Mm-hmm. Damn it. Mm-hmm. So, no, it's it's an awesome fix. I'm really glad to do that. I do actually like the headset integration as well. Yeah. I think that's really nice to have. Mm-hmm. But the HDR pass-through, I mean, see, it doesn't affect a lot of people because obviously 4K isn't quite there yet. But for those of us that jumped in right away with 4K TV, damn it. Mm-hmm. Now I'm I'm with you, dude. I'm I'm in the same exact boat, so I got to get out, switch the cables out. It's a it's a minor nuisance, but a nuisance nonetheless. And while it would have been great to have this new box compatible with old headsets, and you know that have some of these new features in the in the base headset at launch, this is this is the price of jumping in at, at ground zero, right, man? Like this is what mm-hmm. happens with technology. Mm-hmm. If you're there on day one, you accept the fact that there's going to be improvements to the hardware down the line, and you are going to have to make the decision whether to buy the improvement or to hold on to the one that you have and wait for the next improvement that comes on sometime down the line. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this is not altogether unexpected that something like this was going to come through the pipeline. They're going to constantly iterate and evolve PlayStation VR and the way it looks now and the way it looks a year uh, a year into its life, and the way it's going to look five years in are, are going to look significantly different. So, this is just uh, this is kind of what you deal with, man. Jumping in there, jumping in there on day one. Um, mm-hmm. Also, of note here, they are considering bringing out a uh, a PlayStation Four uh, 
exclusive version of the PlayStation Move controller, which will have a micro uh, USB connection. So the same connection that the uh, that the DualShock 4s have right now, as opposed to the one that's uh, as opposed to the PS3 connection that's on there. Um, Frankie, what do you think, man? You think this is a a good update to the headset here? Yeah, I I still have 4K TV, so I don't have yeah. a reason to update my headset, really. So that's fine. But mm-hmm. like you said, it's early adopter. You know, you're gonna there's gonna be you know better improvements to the headset in the mm-hmm. future. But yeah. We've been here since day one, so that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah, Bendy, you uh, you hopping into the HDR revolution anytime soon? Huh? <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, nah. <laughs> I'll, I'll hang on to the headset that I have, and I'm happy with it. It's fine. Um, you know, I'll, I'll wait until they if they do do like a PSVR two or something mm-hmm. like that, where it's like a totally updated headset or something like that with yeah better better. Uh, visuals or something i don't know some mm-hmm. major update i'll, I'll I, I, I might consider upgrading but other than that no i'm happy with what i've got yeah have you uh have you been considering 4k at all or is that something that uh is on your radar at all for the future not anytime soon i, I eventually I, it's something i'd like to upgrade up to but mm-hmm. for now i'm happy with with the tv i have and i'll, I'll eventually upgrade but for now i, I, I don't know yeah, I'm I'm fine right now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, no rush in any of that stuff. So right. Uh, so some cool improvements here with the uh, you know some small improvements, but but some very uh, quality of life type of improvements for you. So if you are able to get in here now, this launches October 14th in Japan. We don't have a North American date yet, so we'll uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for when that might occur. Um, all right, moving on from there. So The Witcher Three got its PS4 Pro patch this week kind of showed up and um from from what i've read from what i understand it's a very very good pro patch digital foundry breaks down the the update um through an article and through a video that they did and they were impressed by it i uh, i think the update sounds awesome sounds like it's uh it's a really nice sprucing up of the game um mm-hmm. so we frankie it also includes down sampling so uh for 1080p tvs does this uh get you jones in the hot back into this game anytime soon I really want to. Uh, I, <laughs> I still that DLC have the DLC to play. Yeah, the DLC also got all all the improvements too. So at some point, I'll get to hop back in there. I don't know. I still don't know when I'm going to do that. Sorry, JD. Uh, it's it's <laughs> it is on the to do list. I I love that game, so I want to get back in there and uh, check out the DLCs because I know people love them. They're it's one of those rare times where the DLC actually gets talked up as much as the base game. So. It's 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 definitely on the to do list. So it'll be cool getting in there and actually getting to see you know the changes firsthand. Mm-hmm. Looks nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Did you fire it up? Did you fire I up did. the patch? Yep. Nice. Yep. Gave it a look, see, and played through for a little bit, and it does look. It looks very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So if if you haven't, I implore you to watch the Digital Foundry video, or just go read the article where they talk about it. They they break it all down in depth. It's really interesting and. Yeah, from watching the video, it looks like it uh, it turned out really, really well. It's it's not a huge patch either. It's only like a hundred megabytes or something like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, a small update for that. Bender, you uh, you finally get to make good on uh, on playing The Witcher anytime soon, man. <laughs> uh, I have the game. I <laughs> I actually started it like a while ago, but I only played for like an hour or or two. Um, seemed kind of cool. I mean, it's it's a game that I'll try out eventually, really get into, but. I don't know. There's just too much to play right now. That's a good step, dude. Only about 99 <laughs> to 129 hours right. left to go. <laughs> oh, and stop that's... it. I finished that game in like 65 hours. <laughs> I was going to say, and that's when you get out of the first town. So that, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, cool. Yeah, but uh, like I said, so, sounds like the the patch turned out great. So uh, so kudos to CD, Pro- CD Project Red for banging that out. All right. The PSN store list or the top sellers for September are are up. And no surprise, Destiny 2 at the top of this list. We uh <laughs> yeah. We we heard when the game was being pre ordered that it was it was breaking records uh in terms of PlayStation store. So no surprise that this game's at the top. Um NBA two K eighteen right there behind it. I mean the sports titles, NBA two K eighteen, FIFA eighteen, Madden NFL eighteen, racking up two, three, and four right behind it. Final Fantasy nine sliding in at five. So I thought that was a, a great showing for that game. Um, EA Sports NHL 18 is there at 6 Grand Theft Auto 5 shocking never seen that game in the top 10 um, 
Rocket League's at 8, Bloodborne's at 9, Star Wars Battlefront Ultimate Edition, rounding out the top 10. 11 through 20, we've got uh, The Last of Us Remastered, Rainbow Six Siege, still doing well. Minecraft, uh, PES 2018, Need for Speed, NBA Live 18, placing significantly lower than NBA 2K18. <laughs> Friday the 13th, they're at 17 still. Uh, Lost Legacies, they're at 18. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite at 19. And Batman Arkham Knight at 20. Um, so, uh, I don't know, any, anything stand out to you guys on this list? Other than uh, dude, as you were going down that list, I was like, "Man, I'm not hearing NBA Live. That can't be good." And then we finally got to yeah. it. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's a rough go, but not 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 surprising at all. Have we uh, have we, has anybody read anything or heard anything about NBA Live 18? Is this an improved version of this game at all? I don't remember seeing I, much about it. Like, literally, don't remember hearing anything about this game at launch or any kind of reviews. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Yes, that's your top 20 on PSN. So uh, how long will Destiny 2 be in the top here? Is this a game that's going to be here for the long haul, you think? Mm, you mean at the number one spot? Yeah, uh, just, just in this list, in the top 10. Oh, it'll be. I think I think it'll get through the holidays, probably, especially when the if the new expansion comes out during December that they're, that they're saying. This will probably be a player <laughs> well into the spring. The uh, The other funny thing about this is on the PS4 add-on list, the number one add-on is the Destiny 2 expansion pass, and this thing is not even out yet. So, <laughs> so I, I thought I thought that was that was interesting. So um, I don't know is this the first time we've seen a, an expansion pass hit the top of the charts without actually being out? Uh, it's it's mm. uh it's kind of strange. Yeah, I don't think I've heard of that before. It just it just shows you what what people expect out of the Destiny experience. Like when you get into Destiny, well, they're invested. Yeah, people are invested. Yeah, when you get into Destiny, like you're planning to buy these other things that come out. There's there's no question about it. Um, all right, so moving on from there, uh, Horizon is getting a complete edition. So for fifty dollars on December fifth, you'll be able to pick up uh, obviously Horizon and the Frozen Wilds expansion, as well as all the digital deluxe edition content. Um, so that's uh, weapons, resource packs, a theme, and a digital art book. So uh, that's a obviously a fantastic package for $50. Um, we've waxed poetically about this game in the past, so if you have not picked that up on December 5th, make sure you grab that. God Eater 3 just got announced um, earlier today, I believe. So um, uh, the, the trailer lo- looks rad, you know. So uh, this is another one of these like Monster Hunter type of games. I haven't actually played the the other two God Eaters. I know you have though, Brent. You uh, dabble, I play, dabbled I play around a little, them a little bit. Yeah. So uh, this one is is in the pipeline now. Not sure when it's it's planned to come out, but January twenty sixth. Is it January twenty sixth? Okay. Uh, no, I'm I'm just. I was gonna say, I was saying, man, you got some inside info. Uh, <laughs> that's when Monster Hunter comes out. <laughs> Ah, you clever dog, you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're a fan of God Eater, uh, go watch the trailer. The trailer's pretty rad. Just check that out and be on the lookout for that. Anamorphine's coming to PS4 and PSVR. This is an interesting um, VR uh, or or non-VR adventure game. This uh, also deals with like, uh, some mental health themes. So that uh, could be a heady experience. SingStar Celebration, this is the next PlayLink title. It'd be out on October 24th. And uh, one note here about Neo: The Complete Edition. It's coming to PC now, officially. So uh, sometime in November, I believe it is November seventh, I want to say. But the Neo Complete Edition, which includes Neo and the the three main like DLC packs, we know that's coming to the to the PlayStation Four. It will also be on the PC as well on November seventh. So via Steam, be able to hop in there and grab Neo. Brent. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. All right, let's jump into Bender's World. We're going to talk some Visage. Oh. We a got Bender a joint if I've ever seen one. Oh, absolutely. This uh, IGN uh, received a 22-minute gameplay video of the latest build from Sad Square Studios. And, uh, you know, I watched about 10 minutes of it, and if this thing isn't a complete knockoff of PT, I don't know what is. <laughs> but I mean that in the best way because this thing looks terrifying. But literally, I mean, it, it was seriously, it reminded me a whole lot of PT. I mean, you're standing in a hallway of this creepy house, there's a there's like a light just above like around, around the stairway like there is in the PT demo and it's actually making like this <laughs> sound as it's going back and forth you're just like that really is straight from PT 
Uh, but I only watched about 10 minutes of it because I don't know if that's actually from the game, and I don't want to spo- you know ruin any scares. But, if I understand, but from what I saw in the first 10 minutes or so, it is very unnerving, and I can only imagine what it's like playing with the lights off, surround sound, headphones on. Uh, I'm really excited to, to check this game out when it does launch. But um, uh, again, Visage is a surreal psychological horror game taking place in an old gigantic house where unfathomable horror hides behind the b- banalities of a normal but ever-changing house. You play Dwayne, a mysterious man haunted by malign entities of the past. As you venture into the surreal world, you learn of the stories that tie you to this horrific place. Your goal is to uncover the truth behind it all via through exploration and meticulous examination of the environment around you. It will not be easy. And uh, IGN actually sat down did an interview. There were a couple things that stood out that uh, I wanted to talk about. First up, there's, um, there's something called the insanity meter that takes place in this game. And players must keep it low as they progress through the story. Many things will affect your character's stress and visage. Some obvious, such as the presence of light. Some more obscure, like looking at an unsettling picture or hearing loud noises. The player is given tools to manage the stress to avoid unfortunate situations, but that the player will need to find out on his or her own. Visage is an, is an exploration-driven game, but uh, it doesn't mean it's an easy one. And in terms of its inspiration, obviously other than PT, uh, let's start with the obvious. Silent Hills uh, playable teaser was the first thing that inspired us. The extremely realistic setting and absolutely mind-blowing, terrifying atmosphere really got us, and we wanted more. Uh, we wanted more, like many, many people did. Unfortunately, that project was canceled, so we decided to create our own game with the goal to satisfy our own and ho- all horror fans' thirst for terror. Like I said, watch this trailer. It's on IGN. It's an exclusive 22-minute trailer or gameplay video. It's very unnerving, but you can see the potential with this game. I mean, Sad Square is really going all in on this, and they're they're giving what people want. People played that PT demo, demo, and when Silent Hill was canceled, everyone was pissed, rightfully so, because PT may have not have been what Silent Hill was going to be, but it gave you an idea of what uh, Hideo Kojima and, and uh, what's his name? Um, Guillermo. Del Toro. Yep. Guillermo Del Toro had in mind for this game, so... Uh, I'm really interested in Visage. I, I'm excited. I'm backing this game. I can't wait for this to come out. Yeah, it's it's crazy, dude. To have this one this one demo of PT like spawned this whole like movement, and mm-hmm. it's it's pretty crazy actually that to this point we really haven't got anything that's that's really tried to capture that PT feel or, or has successfully done it. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, it was it was just a really unique demo at the time when it came out and that's why something like visage exists it's just really captured people's imaginations in terms of how horror can be handled in a in an interactive video game setting and um yes yeah, so I'm, I'm really really interested to see where they go with visage too because if they can if they can capture the feel of pt over the the whole course of a, of a game i mean I'm not even sure I can I can play a game like that, but if uh, <laughs> if, uh, if they succeed in that, that that's going to be a pretty pretty wicked experience. Frankie, how do you feel about a game that's based entirely almost on PT, and uh, knowing that they've added some stuff to it like this this insanity meter? That's pretty cool how they got something like that worked in there. So it's, I, I wouldn't say it's like full on management, but it's a little bit of, of 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 management to try to keep your character sane. What's your thoughts on that and, and the insanity meter? It's a good addition, I think, um, especially in a game like that. I actually mm-hmm. wouldn't mind trying to manage something in a game like that. It's I think that kind of helps the immersion. Um, and, and plus, too, like, PT was just so promising. So seeing somebody yeah. kind of take that as an inspiration, run from there, build upon it, like, I cannot wait to play that game. Yeah, uh, and I really hope the insanity meter, as that thing grows, you just start you start seeing more and more terrifying stuff. That you know how you react to it will ultimately determine your fate. You know whether it's real or not, you don't know. But if your insanity meter continues to go up, I really hope it messes with you uh, the higher it gets. Because I mean, ooh, yeah, watch this trailer. It seriously, it looks awesome. I can't wait to see Bender's stream, man. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a fantastic <laughs> show. It's gonna be good times. So uh, let's move on from that. Let's talk about Ubisoft for just a moment. Ubisoft is buying back its own stock to prevent the Vivendi takeover. Ubisoft has announced a buyback program in order to prevent French media uh, conglomerate Vivendi from taking over the company. The game's company has granted a mandate which will allow it to buy back a total number of 4 million shares until December 29, 2017. 
Once the shares have been repurchased, they'll be canceled by Ubisoft, which means they will have no value and cannot be reissued into the market. Now, Ubisoft is taking off the gloves. Now, th- now they're playing for keeps. And by doing this, it's going to make it a little bit more difficult for Vivendi to, uh, to achieve their goal of taking over uh, Ubisoft. So kudos to Yves Guameda. You know, he keeps uh, pulling out the stops and pulling out rabbits out of his hat to make things happen, boys. What's your uh, thoughts on this story, man? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited whenever I hear stuff like this. You know, we, when we've talked about the Vivendi takeover in the <laughs> past, it's just, you know, f- from a from a gamer perspective, from an industry perspective, would just rather see Ubisoft in the GMO's hands. Like this is mm-hmm. these are people that that care about gaming, that have a vision for the company, and we don't really want this media conglomerate overseeing one of the biggest third party developers out there. So anytime we see stuff like this, like I get excited when when Eve and and Ubisoft is getting these little small victories along the way in their in their bid to kind of hold Vivendi off, and it's awesome, man. It's like it's like it's like the David Worth Goliath story. You know, they're they're just mm-hmm. they're they're kind of throwing their rocks and and they're they're hitting their marks and they're just uh, you know slowly but surely fighting these guys off to eventually you know maybe this will will be a non-issue as we move forward here but happy for for even the gmo you know ubisoft does some great stuff for gaming they do some some great stuff throughout the industry so um happy to see them continue to kind of uh you know hold agency over where they go from here and hopefully that continues to be the case Mm -hmm. hopefully keep them off them keep them off me keep fighting the good fight buddy yeah all right, let's jump into some Xbox news. Uh, first up, PUBG could be extending its Microsoft exclusivity period. Hmm. Now, obviously, a week or so ago, we heard play, uh, Blue Hole was in talks with other uh, other publishers, uh, specifically PlayStation, to bring PUBG over to the PlayStation 4. But uh, Blue Hole may be keeping its option open as well by talking to Microsoft about extending the game's Xbox exclusivity. According to Blue B- Bloomberg, sources... Uh, Blue Hole is likely to offer Microsoft a longer console exclusive period with that period lasting until the middle of next year or longer. Microsoft has refused to comment on the issue, of course. But uh, how about this, boys? Blue Hole is kind of like uh, playing both sides here. You know, they're, <laughs> they're talking to PlayStation about getting their, their game out there, which will, I'm sure, once that word got out, Microsoft was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, let's talk about this first. Now, Blue Hole is likely in, uh, in talks to uh, further along their exclusivity period. I mean, Blue Hole, they're holding all the chips right now? Dude, if if that's the case, like this is some this is some shrewd ass moves on their part. <laughs> like they they've come out, they came out at Gamescom, they uh, announced a partnership with Microsoft. Shortly after that, they're talking uh I think it was with Bloomberg about how they're speaking to everybody about PUBG, specifically mm-hmm. Sony specifically mentioned we're speaking to sony and playstation about getting the game on the platform so if this is like a a a whole master plan on their part to announce their partnership then throw the sony nugget out there then go back to microsoft and be like look you see what kind of a a ripple this is causing by just us mentioning playstation in a sentence to bloomberg like let's see what kind of money you guys can put on the table and this will be a non-issue moving forward that's some shrewd ass business if that's the case so um, mm-hmm. I don't know uh, where Blue Hole went to business school, but these guys are are playing uh, <laughs> playing uh, hardball here, man. If if that's the case, this is of course right. this is of course, you know, hearsay right now until we see otherwise. Yeah, Frankie, what do you think? If that's the case, man, what, what do you think about uh, Blue Hole's business practices, man? I mean, I suppose they're smart. <laughs> you know, they obviously know right now, like they're the hot thing, and obviously, I think you know, especially things like Fortnite out there. You know, I, I, they have to know, like, this game is going to be, like, the number one battle royale game forever. So I think it's mm-hmm. smart of them to try and get what they can out of it now while it's the big hot one. So, mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm kind of curious to what you guys think about how Fortnite is coming into play here. Obviously, Fortnite just announced they they crossed 7 million players. I mean, for, <laughs> Fortnite's at 7 million. That's doing pretty good. Even though it's a free-to-play title, so it's a little bit more accessible. But still, 7 million players for a free-to-play game that, from what I've played and what I've heard from others, it's it's a pretty good battle, battle royale game. Mm-hmm. Like, it actually is – it's it's a pretty good game with the Fortnite, you know, DNA running through it. Uh, do you think that's coming into play here, boys? Uh, I think it could be. I, I think, Frankie, I think you hit the nail on the head there, man. I think they uh, 
and this this could definitely be another aspect of this. They see the writing on the wall at this point. Like, look, this thing, uh, PUBG has blown up. You know, there's 13, 14 million, however many millions of people have bought this game and are playing it at this point. They see that this has become like a subgenre unto itself, and they see what Fortnite has done with Battle Royale, and they see the writing on the wall. Like, they see that this is going to be a game mode that's going to show up in somebody else's game probably many uh, many other people's games in the near future here and it's probably going to end up being more polished than than PUBG it's probably going to show up in like a, you know we've talked about it in like a Ubisoft game or something like that like this mode is going to show up and if they can get the money that they can get while they can like if they can get Microsoft mm-hmm. to sign on the dotted line and they're like hey you know they they see the writing on the wall like let's get this inked let's get this deal inked let's get as much money as we can from this before this becomes something that shows up in every game so that's uh mm-hmm. that's a hell of a move on their part if they can pull it off but there's no question that the stuff that we're seeing from Fortnite is factoring into this decision if this is indeed the case and you know this is like i said this is going to be an issue moving forward and uh yeah and many people are are loving Fortnite and that battle royale mode and it's free you can, you can mm-hmm. get in there and just and just play it. So, mm-hmm. you know, and it makes me wonder about something else too. I mean, if they're going back to Microsoft to say, "Hey, look, we want to extend this exclusivity," um, you know, with these other games like Fortnite, and you know, like you said, there could be other games like Tom Clancy games. I could see just going nuts with this battle royale field. That means the market's going to get oversaturated pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So uh, to go, be able to go back to Microsoft, I feel like Blue Hole has to have like an ace up their sleeve. They have to have a roadmap for for um, PUBG that looks very, very appealing. I just don't think you can go back to Microsoft and say, hey, look, we want this extra money for its exclusivity for a game that's probably going to be in a very oversaturated market by the time it comes out to PlayStation 4 and all these other places. Or even prior, maybe before that. I mean, like you said, we're at Fortnite right now. Who's to say that The Division or Ghost Recon Wildlands doesn't get... Uh, a, 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 a battle royale mode at some point. Mm. It just seems like you know if they're going to Microsoft, they can't. I don't think they can just simply say, "Hey, look, we'll extend it." I think they got to have something else. So possibly, if they are going back, maybe they have a, a roadmap that looks pretty impressive. Maybe they got some bigger ideas for PUBG. Who knows? I think, I think that's certainly a possibility. But could this also be a case of of desperate times? So, so we, we yeah. we've got a Microsoft here who's uh, you know canceled several of their high profile exclusives. Don't have much in the mm-hmm. exclusive docket on the horizon. They're you know quote unquote losing the console race right now by a wide margin. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. would it, if they look at that or not? Who knows? I'm sure they I'm sure they do. They of course want to be number one, but whether or not that's mm-hmm. a driving focus of their business, I I don't really know. So when you when you put those kind of uh, you know, variables into this situation, like maybe Microsoft's a little more likely to just be like, okay, what do we got to do to keep you exclusive on our console for that much longer? Like to get to mm-hmm. get that many more people to buy an Xbox for this game. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's really interesting, man. I'm, I'm curious to see if if this is indeed the case. Like if these talks are really going on. Mm. Yeah, that's that's gonna heat up, man. It's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple months. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, I'm 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 excited to see what happens with that. But um, uh, moving on, Xbox One S Assassin's Creed Origins bundle launches along the game alongside the game on October 27th. This is actually a pretty sweet bundle. I like this. You get an Xbox One S one terabyte uh, for 349 or a 500 gig for 299. But you also get obviously a full game download for uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. But you also get a code for Rainbow Six Siege, mm. which is pretty sweet. That's a nice little bundle right there. Plus, you obviously get the uh, one month of Xbox Game Pass subscription and a 14 day trial uh, for Xbox Live. But I like that they're tossing in Rainbow Six Siege. That's that's a nice little bundle right there for for 349 or 299 respectively. That's a uh, that's something Ubisoft has done with a lot of their with a lot of their games in recent memory. Mm-hmm. At least on the Xbox, they throw in a lot of the backwards compatible games. Like when you buy their games, so yep. we we see them doing that a lot. So you know, hey. Whatever mm-hmm. they got to do to and, – and Rainbow Six is an interesting game because that's kind of a games-as-a-service kind of game. So when they get mm-hmm. that into people's hands, then people are like, okay, well, let me get these operators. Let me, like, pump some money to this. I got the game for free. I, you know, I don't mind spending 20 bucks on a, on an operator pack or whatever. This game's sweet. So Yeah, I'll grab the season pass yeah. for, you know, for you know obviously less than what the game yeah. runs. So yeah. that's a nice little addition there. Um, game gifting is now available for select inside uh, program members. I think uh, gift 
gaming or game gifting is an awesome concept. I'm glad they're bringing it there. I hope we get it over on PlayStation as well mm -hmm. because that's a really cool feature to have. To be able to sit there and buy Cuphead for a friend and just send it to their account. You just I, I'm not sure of the process of it yet because I, I haven't gotten that process yet on my on my Xbox One, but would love to look at it and see how that works. Man, I, I'm assuming you just put the person's name, buy them the game, and gift it to them. Yeah, I think it just sends them a code. And they uh, that's they awesome. Put it and they punch it in or whatever and download it. That that's that's a really cool feature. So I'm glad to see that's making its way to Xbox One. Hopefully, it makes it over to the PlayStation Four as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we mentioned earlier uh, the kind of like the the goofy converse, controversy surrounding uh, Shadow of War and now Forza Seven. But uh, Turn Ten has responded to the Forza VIP controversy. This is Alan Hartman, studio of head of Turn Ten. Uh, the developer behind the Forza Motorsport series, he has responded to a fan outcry uh, around controversy, controversial changes to its VIP members program, penning an open letter to the community and apologizing for the upset, assuring fans that a feature is being worked on that will provide double credits for all VIP members, as well as providing an immediate one million credit apology. So, obviously, I haven't played Forza 7. I'm not really familiar with what happened with Forza 7, where people were upset about it. Uh, but again, it sounds like is this something to do with loot boxes or loot crates or something along those lines? Well, some something with the way their VIP membership worked in the past. They changed the way it worked for Forza Seven, and people were upset about it. So I don't know if if it was. Uh, I think it was something based around around uh, rewards that you were getting as mm. as a VIP member. So they mm. uh, it's been a controversy in the community, and uh, sounds like they're correcting it. That's cool. Well, that's a good thing. Another developer that listens to uh, its community. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> one interesting picture that made its way out on, on social media this week was uh, inside every Xbox One is a little picture of Master Chief riding a scorpion. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw this picture. It's pretty cute. Yeah. It's just like this little mini Master Chief just riding a scorpion, and uh, it, it looks pretty funny. I can tell you right now, though, I'm not going to open up my Xbox One X to find the damn thing. So. That's just not going to happen. Uh, Cuphead developer, uh, Studio MDHR, is working on a PC save issue. Uh, they have confirmed it's aware of the bug that's causing save issues on PC and is currently working on it. Here's what they had to say. It's true. We are aware of an issue, and we're working on a patch for it as we speak. We hope to have it pushed out very, very soon. Um, I'm, I, don't, I think this is just specifically related to the PC version. Yes, it is. Uh, I'm not. I'm not even sure what. What's the? Is it corrupting saves? Is that basically it's, it? Or uh, is that what we're looking at? People are sh are logging back into their game and their save's not there. So I don't even know oh, if it's corrupting. Wow. It's just disappearing. Um, oh. So man, I I hope when I, I hope when I turn the game back on that my save is there. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't realize this was an issue. So. <laughs> well, look out now. Yeah. I'm on Xbox One, so I have no. I have no worries. Yeah. I know my save is there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you you uh, one of those guys, huh? Yeah, I'm one of those guys. I rub it in. <laughs> and lastly, Shovel Knight gets free Battletoads DLC on PC. Need to download that so as there well. There you go. Pick that up as well. So that's it for uh, for the Xbox news. Um, again, we want to mention Fortnite has passed seven or passes seven million players, and uh, Epic Games is on uh, is on a roll banning at least thousands <laughs> of them uh, for cheating. Um, Epic Games has no hesitation in banning uh, more with Nathan Mooney, community coordinator, uh, confirming the battle sheets in Fortnite is the highest priority across the company. They have banned thousands of people already. And uh, that just, man, that, that just stuff, that stuff just drives me nuts. Why? I don't know. Why do people want to cheat? I don't know. It's weird. I, just, I don't get that. I don't get the point. Yes, if you cheat, you win, but... Don't you realize that you're looking at the women like, yeah, I won, but I suck because I cheated at it because I, I am no good at the game. I had to cheat. Mm -hmm. It's just an empty reward. I mean, Bender, would you ever jump into a game online and if you discovered a cheat, would you would you really get anything out of it every time you won a match? No, no, it would, it would kind of take away from the satisfaction of of winning if you had to cheat every time to win. Frankie just has this smirk on his face like he's like, I really want to answer this and be like, yeah, I get off on it. How many times have we cheesed the Crota? Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's not like a PvP thing, though. Yeah, true, that's not uh, PvP. 
<laughs> We're just moving goalposts here. Oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> also, also with that though, like look how much more fun that raid is when you actually like go through it. <laughs> instead, yeah, that's true. instead yeah. of just standing around and jumping in pits, like it's actually, it's it's much more fun to actually play through it the way it's meant to be played. This is true. And lastly, we'll jump talk about some uh, some Nintendo news here. First up, sounds like the SNES SNES Classic is selling pretty well. Uh, but it seems the demand has been pretty intense, with GameStop reporting that their entire supply sold out within minutes, but the retailer assures customers that fresh stock will be arriving very soon. GameStop Senior Vice President of Merchandising Bob Puzun had this to say, Nintendo has done it again. Customers demand, customer demand for the SNES Classic was just like we expected. We sold out of our SNES Classic inventory within minutes, in both of our GameStop and Think Geek, uh, Think Geek retail channels. So, SNES Classics uh, selling very well. Is anyone surprised? <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Zero surprise. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll fi- yeah, so we're going to find out if Nintendo will make good on their word of making sure that we will have plenty of these out this fall. But um, we'll have to wait for the next uh, shipment to come in. But it is selling off the shelves very, very quickly. So, if you get a chance to get in and get one, grab it while you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, last week we talked about uh, Unity having some issues uh, affecting uh, a couple of games uh, in Switch development. Unity Japan, uh, Unity Japan Regional Director Hiroki Ome said, uh, "We continue to partner closely with Nintendo to optimize Unity on Switch." Ome also points out the relative popularity of Unity for Switch development. He had this to say. Unity has been providing developer support for Nintendo Switch since day one, and we're proud to report that more than 30% of the games released on Switch to date are made with Unity and are happy to see our developers finding great success on the system. Hmm. So despite the issues that we've seen with, like, Ukulele and Battle Chasers, you know, Unity is still working very hard with Nintendo to optimize the the engine so that the games will run properly. And as they mentioned, you know, 30% of the games that are out there right now are running on Unity, so it is it, it is a, an engine that we're, has found success on the Switch. We're just hoping they can iron out these issues so we can get this n- next slate of games out as quickly as possible. Yeah, and with, and with 30% of the games released for Switch being developed on Unity, like, I think it's a pretty safe bet that we'll see continue to see lots of Unity support when it comes to Nintendo mm-hmm. Switch development, so I think that's a good sign for like Battle Chasers and for Ukulele and for some of these people that are waiting for this to be updated and fixed and in the future as well like people uh, uh unity is going to be constantly updating this because there's so many people that want to use this platform to develop games for the switch so it's a good sign mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. bender are you waiting for uh battle chasers on the switch is that where you plan on jumping into it uh yeah possibly uh, that seems like a good spot to to get it and be able to play it on the go so yeah i think i might might pick it up on the switch when it comes out Dude, I think you will love that game on the Switch. Yeah. I really do. I think it'll be a fantastic. I'm going to have a real hard time not picking that up on Switch. <laughs> like, I really, really am going to struggle with that. I'm. It's probably a 75% chance I'm going to get it, but I don't want to get it on the Switch because I've already bought it on the PS4 and it's the fall. But, damn, having a game like that on the go would be really, really, really good. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Frankie can attest to that. Yep. I already pre-ordered it on the Switch, too, so... <laughs> There it is. See? It's impossible not to want to get it on the Switch. It'll be a great game on the Switch. Uh, Mutant Muds, the collection, is coming to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, A three-game compilation that brings the beloved platformers plus a new game in the series to to Nintendo's latest console. The collection, which is set for a release in quarter four of 2017, will include, include Mutant Muds Deluxe, Mutant Muds Super Challenge, and the brand new puzzler, Mud Blocks. (laughs) So uh, I played both uh, Mutant Muds Deluxe and Mutant Muds Super Challenge. Those games are awesome, and those two will flourish on the Switch. They'll be right at home uh, uh, on the go. Um, I, I think they'll probably look a lot better on the go on that smaller screen. They're not, like, technically demanding games, but uh, they're super, super fun and very, very, very challenging. Boys, you've played a couple of these, haven't you? Yeah. Mutant Muds are, are definitely fun. Um, the only thing I'd be wary about is the D-pad. On the on the yeah, Joy-Con, so yeah. I mean, I like to play these kind of games with the D-pad, but you know, if forced to, I'd, I'd just use the stick, and that, that'd probably be all right. But uh, it would be nice to have a have a proper D-pad on there. It would be. I'm sure. I'm sure the gameplay will still be fun. Hopefully. Yeah. And then, uh, lastly, the Miiverse. 
Nintendo has launched one final Miiverse community where users can share their memories of the service before it closes next month. The community, called Everybody's Message Community, <laughs> is now live. According to a Miiverse announcement from Nintendo, the community will remain open until October 11th. Bender, are you going to get in there and do anything with the Miiverse, bud, before it closes? No, probably not. But um, <laughs> Miiverse was pretty cool, though. I mean, especially the, the really artistic people would like do these intricate drawings you know, on the Wii U gamepad and post them to Miiverse. They were really cool. And apparently Nintendo has, has made some way for them to like download their their artwork and save them or for, you know before the Miiverse goes away, which is cool. But um, it I mean it, it had its time. It was it was an interesting social media space. But uh, I'm I'm not I, I, it's not going to affect my life too much for for it to be <laughs> gone. Was the Miiverse basically their version of PlayStation Home? I. Uh, never used playstation home so i don't know but um i don't know it was you no know, it was just a, basically a social media like each each game had its had its own page oh, where people okay, could comment okay. or give hit tips or or hints or whatever or post screenshots or or draw pictures um stuff like that so so for every every wii u game there's a meverse page for it for them people to talk about the game yeah, I posted a lot of pictures on there, and the mods <laughs> took them down really quick. So uh, I can tell you they're they're pretty good on Miiverse. They don't let any uh, any of those pictures get through very for very long. So <laughs> rest in peace, uh, Miiverse. But uh, gentlemen, that's gonna do it for this week's show, Mister Boyce. Where can we find you gaming and tweeting? As always, Brent, I'll be not tweeting at Piccolo nine thirty. It's also my PSN and, uh, and Switch ID. The uh, the Tuesday night indie spotlight will be in your hands this week. It'll be on Tuesday, 10 p.m. Eastern, on our YouTube channel, Short Pause Gaming. So make sure you check that out. I'll be tuning in to see Echo because I think that looks rad. I'm really excited to play Echo. Mr. Holt. I'm on Twitter at Bender underscore guitar. You can find me on PlayStation Network and Nintendo Network at me underscore Bender. And Xbox Live at me Bender 82 Franklin. You can find me on Twitter, Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, Nintendo Network, <clears throat> at Viper Strike. Thank you, sir. You can find me on Twitter at the Dude 1979 PlayStation Network, the Nintendo Switch, the Dude 79 and Xbox Live, the Real Dude 79 Make sure you visit the website, www.shortpause.com. Follow us on Twitter, at the Short Pause. Subscribe to the Short Pause YouTube gaming channel, Short Pause Gaming. Obviously, if you're watching the podcast this week, you don't see our smiling faces. You're just getting the audio version. I apologize. That's my fault. And it's going to be the same thing next week. But thank you to Bender for editing the podcast. Obviously, he did a fantastic job. Even though I haven't heard it yet, I know that when I hear it, when you guys are listening to it, it's going to be a fantastic job. So now that I've confused myself, you can follow this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you really like this podcast, if you really, really like it, go over to iTunes, give us a five-star rating, write out a lovely review. If you don't think the podcast is any good, that's fine too. Come over to the website, go right into the comments, write out a nice post about what you would like to see us do better. Or if you have to get really, really nasty, send us an email, podcast at shortpause.com. We forward those right to Bender, and he will call you back personally <laughs> to tell you the changes we'll be making on your behalf. Sorry, let me uh, let me write this down. What do you do if you don't like the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> one, one more time. For, uh, sorry, I just want... Just, <laughs> man, you're savage. For Mr. Holt, Mr. Boyce, and Mr. Ayler, I'm Brent Felsing. Thanks again for listening and watching the Short Pause Gaming Podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Good night, everybody. See you guys. Bye-bye.